Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I said in our last lecture that I wanted to talk a little more about Herodotus in this lecture. I want to do so not just because he's the major source for the Persian Wars, but because he is pivotal in the development of Greek historiography, another product of the Archaic period. In fact, he's commonly called the father of history. So we're meeting yet another father, as we've met the father of democracy with Solon, and the father of law with Dracon. I'll say a few more words about him now before moving on to discuss the Battle of Marathon, which is going to be the core of this opening part of the lecture. Herodotus was a Greek from Halicarnassus in Caria. This is the modern-day Turkish city of Bodrum. And he is commonly called, as I say, the father of history, since he was the first to write serious research. The title of his work, Historiae, simply means researches, uh, although it is commonly translated as the histories. He wrote this work uh, and giving not merely a blow-by-blow -blow kind of chronicle or account of the Persian Wars, uh, because Herodotus was keen to try to find out how the war between Persia and Greece, between the East and West, that is, arose. And in doing so, he begins by going right back to the time of the Trojan War, which for the Greeks was history. It was historical in some very loose sense uh, compared to what they believed it to be. Uh, there was some great conflict at the end of the Bronze Age between the Hittites in northwestern Turkey and the Greeks. Um, and uh, uh, that certainly, uh, Herodotus was not alone in thinking that the origins of the later Persian Wars uh, lie with the Trojan War. Uh, for instance, it is no coincidence that Later on, the, in, on the Parthenon in Athens, one of the reliefs, which you see in front of you here, shows the Greeks battling the Trojans. And this was meant to evoke that sort of idea of East versus West, of Greek versus, versus Persian. Um, and so Herodotus is therefore suggesting to later Greeks, as well as to us, that these Persian wars were in some sense inevitable. Uh, he is reinforcing the need to know our history and to understand, and I mean really understand, and not just on a curse, cursory level, that, to understand the differences in culture, the differences in religion and beliefs, and to take those differences seriously. And this is a lesson, of course, that applies to us now just as much as it did then, uh, when we have our own great clashes uh, between East and West in our own day. And, uh, of course, we can think of events in the past several decades uh, that uh, could have been handled very differently, I think, if people had really known their history, if people had really taken cultural and religious differences more seriously, as opposed to trying simply to impose one system of government, one system of, of um, uh, say, democracy upon a people that really have uh, never really had that uh, throughout their history. But that is another story. Herodotus is... Uh, dealing with a large time span, much of his work consists of digressions about persons, places, and things. Because he made his living out of reciting his work and so uh, needed to keep the interest level of his audience high, he fills his work, which uh, is divided into nine books, uh, into lots of these digressions. So, for instance, the entire second book is really just one long digression about the customs and history of Egypt from the days of the pharaohs down unto his own. Herodotus believed in the traditional gods, and he puts forward a lot of supernatural explanations for why things happened. To Herodotus, for example, a drought had nothing to do with the uh, natural disaster of not having rain, but was a punishment from the gods. Nevertheless, his work is distinguished from previous poets and chroniclers who merely told stories, uh, as many cultures in the Near East did have some version of that, you know, the, we can think of the Egyptians or the Babylonians, they did have some sense of chronicling the events that took place. But what really makes his um, histories d different and why he is known as the father of history is because he took a keen account in understanding things for their causes, trying to look into what were the larger events and then trying to not just give a blow-by-blow -blow account of what happened, but why it happened, what was really going on here, putting those events in context. And he did so in particular by personal uh, um, observation of events. Uh, for instance, with Egypt, he went to Egypt uh, and he tells us um, 
about uh, how, imp how important personal observation was to him, rather than simply relying on hearsay. And in his quest for truth and information about Egypt, he, he went to the priests, he tells us, and he asked them questions because he knew that they kept the most accurate records. And this is the same sort of thing that he would do throughout the chronicling of the war against Persia. Interestingly enough, uh, from an etymological point of view, the word for personal uh, observation in Greek is autopsia, okay, which of course gives us our word autopsy. That is really what that means, is having a personal view of something, a up-close personal view of our observation. Herodotus's account of the events of the Persian War is generally reliable because he lived through them. Uh, although he probably wrote about them in the middle of the 5th century, although and the events themselves took place at the earlier part of the 5th century. But nevertheless, um, and even though he might not have remembered everything so sharply, and the people he talked to might not have remembered things so sharply, nevertheless, he is generally reliable about a lot of the events, um, even though sometimes he does stray into some kind of, you know, somewhat mythical storytelling about things, uh, that uh, those, those aspects tend to tend to be uh, focused more in the earlier books of his histories, not so much in the events of the war, which occupy the later books of his history. Um, and the one thing, though, one of the things that you do really have to take with a big grain of salt um, is his use of numbers uh, in his accounts of battles uh, and uh, in, in his accounts of other events. Sometimes he gets a lot of things. They're very hyperbolic. OK, and we'll have opportunity to comment on that sort of stuff as we go on. Now. If we just return to the Ionian Revolt, where we left off in the last lecture, it took the Persians from, well, the uh, Ionian Revolt lasted from 499 to 494 or 493. Uh, and it had been at best a gallant failure, uh, but it had shown three things. First of all, it showed the, that Persian power long regarded as invincible could be countered, if only for a while. Secondly, the importance of fleets in naval battle, naval warfare was definitely um, brought to the fore, since the revolt ended at the decisive Battle of Lade. And third of all, it showed the need for unity in resisting a common foe. Herodotus believed that disunity among the Greeks uh, was the cause of the defeat at the Battle of Lade. Um, and this disunity should not come as a surprise, I think, given that we know, uh, or what we know rather, about how Greeks felt towards each other, this feeling of xenophobia that was as much part and parcel of the polis system as autonomy was, as also the sense of freedom that they cherished so much. Xenoph xenophobia was very much built into the whole polis system. We, I think, should find it surprising that when we uh, that this was still the case when we consider that the Greeks were facing a threat that affected all of them. But at the end of the day, these differences still ruled. You would expect common unity, but there simply wasn't any. And so it took the Persians from 499 to say 493 to deal with the Ionian revolt, but deal with it they did. The Battle of Lade in 494 put paid to the idea of a free and independent Greek community carved out from the Persian Empire's western frontier. Lade was lost when all but 11 of the 60 Samian ships fighting for the Ionian Greeks hoisted sail and fled. The 70 ships of Lesbos panicked and followed suit shortly thereafter. This represented a full 34% of the Ionian fleet, if Herodotus' ship counts are to be believed, and the vastly shrunken remainder was easily defeated by the Persians. And with this uh, final battle of Lade, resistance to Persia effectively collapsed, and Darius, that is the Persian king, was finally free to turn his attention to the Athenians, whom he had a sl slave remind him uh, about at every single meal. He would apparently, Herodotus tells us, would have a slave stand next to him at every meal, and, uh, and this slave would say, sire, remember the Athenians. Now, you have to remember that Persia in the early 5th century was the greatest empire in the world. Darius ruled over lands vast, uh, vastly beyond counting. Uh, he had wealth that even the most powerful Greek city-states could only dream of, and could muster both an army and navy so enormous and well-equipped that it would be impossible to stand against it. 
He could draw on subject peoples from modern-day India and the East to the coast of modern Turkey in the West and from the southern shore of the Black Sea in the North to Egypt in the South. The title King of Kings was given to him, and it certainly was justified in terms of his grandeur. The Greeks would have been reasonably terrified, I think, at the prospect of a Persian invasion, and resistance truly would have seemed futile to many. Now, Darius uh, did invade in the following year, and he sent his son-in-law, Mardonius, to lead a huge army into Greece through a massive amphibious operation. The Persians either lacked reliable local pilots and navigators to advise them, or they took unnecessary risks because this first fleet that was meant to carry the army over to Greece was caught in a violent storm as it rounded the Cape of Mount Athos, one of the three kind of fingers of land jutting out from just uh, south of modern-day Thessalonica in northern Greece. Herodotus gives the very likely exaggerated figure of 300 ships lost and 20,000 men. But even accounting for exaggeration, we can guess that the casualties were extreme. Worse still, the disaster emboldened the local Thracian tribes who attacked the surviving Persians while they made camp, doing even more damage, and uh, even wounded Mardonius himself. Mardonius and his army exacted savage retribution against the Thracians, but in the end, the expedition had, been, uh, had to be abandoned. Still, by the end of 492, Persia had pacified Thrace and had forced Macedonia, which was very weak at this point, to submit to Darius. And, it, and the Persians captured the island of Thassos, which is just off of Thrace's south, uh, southern coast. It was a far cry from Athens, but it was a start. And Darius tried again two years later, making Mardonius stay home, whether to recover from his wound or his punishment for failing in the last expedition, we don't know. And he sent another invasion force under Datis, a Persian admiral known for his expertise in all matters Hellenic. With him went the satrap Artaphernes, whom, uh, uh, who was a, a kind of trusted uh, satrap of these governors uh, of regions within the Persian Empire. Scholarly, scholars endlessly dispute the size of this force that they commanded. Herodotus gives us the figure of over 600 ships, but most agree that it was overwhelming by any measure, certainly enough to challenge all the city-states of Greece, even if they united to oppose it. However, other scholars argue, and convincingly, I think, that the Persian army wasn't that much larger than the force, the force that the Greeks mustered against it. This belief in a smaller Persian army is definitely a minority view, but we do have to note it here, and we have to keep it in mind as we describe the events that will follow. Whatever the case of that may be, whatever the size of the Persian army, we have to bear in mind that the only people that the Greek city-states hated more than the Persians were their fellow Greeks, as we mentioned, the xenophobia. There was no chance that they would unite to oppose anyone. Macedonia and Thrace, as I just mentioned, were already and now under Persian control. And as Datis's fleet island hopped across the Aegean, the Persians added the isles of Naxos and Delos to their territorial rules. Finally, they set down on the island of Euboea, which is this kind of long finger-like island that is just off the coast of, uh, of the Attic Peninsula. And uh, the Eretrians were immediately besieged and, and, their, and, and were defeated. They were enslaved and slaughtered. A grim message of what the Athenians could expect very soon. The Athenians were joined only by the comparatively tiny city-state of Plataea, contributing just a thousand hoplites to the Greek cause. And this uh, contingent joined the 9,000, perhaps 10,000 hoplites that scholars believe the Athenians fielded, a drop in the bucket, really, about to be swept away by the Persian tide, uh, which was at least something like 25,000 infantry and maybe 1,000 cavalry. And of course, that is not even counting the 100,000 or so odd sailors and ship's crewmen that uh, would that could also serve as light troops if need be. So it was a very lopsided sort of thing going on here in terms of what um, uh, what the Greeks uh, were able to put up with uh, put up against the Persian onslaught. Athens and Sparta were not friends at this point, um, but the enemy of an enemy 
is a friend and Sparta had absolutely, uh, you know, impeccably uh, strong anti-Persian credentials. Um, and so Sparta and Athens, therefore, were at least ostensibly united in terms of their anti-Persian front. Okay. Um, now, so it was that in 490, a, this Persian fleet of maybe perhaps 600 ships, if Herodotus is correct, and 20,000 men, sailed to Greece, and the warfare began. The number of ships doesn't really doesn't really matter here. But after Eubea fell, I'm sorry, I, yes, after Eretria fell, after the seven-day siege, the Persians burned down the city temples, uh, and I reckon a goodly number of the houses too. Of all of this, of course, was in revenge for the burning of Sardis in 498, which uh, uh, precipitated the whole Persian, uh, the Ionian revolt. It is hardly surprising that there was panic in Athens when the Persians left Euboea and crossed to land at Marathon in eastern Attica. Uh, this is the same place, you recall, where Pisistratus had landed in 545 BC after his self-imposed exile in Thrace. And from Marathon, Pisistratus had defeated the army of, uh, of nobles at Pelini and went on to seize Athens, as we remember from an earlier lecture. And this particular incident, plus the fact that none other than Hippias, the son of Pisistratus, as a very old man, was part of the Persian contingent that landed at Marathon, would probably... Um, seemed to the Athenians uh, as though history was about to be repeated. In other words, it seems as if that the, the Athenians would have thought that Pisistratus had now was now marching on Athens a second time and trying to seize power a second time because his son, uh, Hippias, as I say, who was probably in his 70s or 80s even at this point, was about to do the same thing, this time with Persian backing. See, when he had been kicked out after the, the uh, murder of his brother Hipparchus, he had fled over to, to to Persia, and now the Persians were trying to bring him back. It seems he was at the head of their their invasion force. So the Athenians mobilized an army, and they sent a certain man named Phidippides to run to Sparta, pleading for immediate help. This made sense, since Sparta, as we know, had the strongest and best trained land army on the Greek mainland. The runner Phidippides was dispatched, complete, completing the 150-mile rocky mountainous route in just a day and a half. This, at least modern scholars have confirmed, is doable by a trained ultra-marathon runner, which Phidippides surely was. You have to remember, there weren't really any roads in those days, so everything had to be done by running over, you know, just, uh, uh, this was the fastest way of communication. And actually, since uh, 1983 AD, uh, there is an annual Spartathon, uh, as a, or Spartathlon run, which traces Phidippides' route. And there's actually a Greek man, an ultra marathoner named Yanis Kouros, who holds the record of being able to do this run in 20 hours and 25 minutes. Um, uh, and in, 19, in 2017, actually, 264 people finished uh, this, uh, this race in under 36 hours. So it is physically possible, although even the very thought of it makes me tired. Uh, Phidippides found the Spartans in the middle of their most sacred festival, the Carnea, which the Spartans, of course, claimed they could not possibly violate by sending help before it was complete. You see, they said it would be unlawful religiously uh, to send an army while they're doing their religious festivals. Sparta's reputation for strict obedience to religious scruples was well known, except when it wasn't. Um, there are multiple examples of Sparta flouting religion when it suited them. Um, uh, for instance, uh, they killed Persian envoys uh, who came and, and, and asked them for earth and water. That is a, a major violation of religious, uh, religious protocol there, to name just one example. And there's others too. And we'll, we'll take a look at this in a moment because it's an interesting question. The Spartans certainly could have marched to the defense of Greece, but they did not. Scholars have debated the reasons why. It's possible the Spartans were genuinely moved by religious conviction, but it is also possible that they were concerned about a helot revolt if they sent their army away. Um, 
And that is, we're going to see as a major theme of Spartan history going forward. They're, oh, they never want to stay away from their homeland very long because uh, they, they always have this Achilles heel. They always have this possibility of the helots rising in revolt. Those are both possible explanations. But I uh, would put forward a more cynical motivation, or at least I will suggest that it is possible that their motives were more cynical. Sparta, like all Greek city-states, acted first and foremost in its own interests. And its own interests, in this case, were this. Athens was a democracy, which to Sparta meant mob rule. Worse still, Athens' success um, was a stinging slap in the face of Sparta and a reminder to all of Greece that Sparta had failed spectacularly in the past to subjugate Athens. Okay, Remember, there had been all of this history with Cleomenes coming and uh, and all of that sort of thing com- uh, going on uh, in the in the years and decades prior to this, the very ba- best outcome of the Persian invasion force, therefore, would be for it to bash itself to pieces against the Athenians and their Plataean allies, and then Sparta could either march north and mop up the victorious but weakened Persian army, or better yet, it could stay safely in the Peloponnesus, forcing the Persians either to go through an arduous march with all the dangers of ambush, starvation, and desertion that hung over any large ancient army in the field and foreign territory, Um, or uh, the Persians could chance a sea voyage with a very real risk of destruction by storm. All of this besides the fact that Sparta's close ally Corinth held the narrow isthmus that any land army trying to reach Sparta would have had to cross, cross through. Therefore, Sparta could have a ready buffer and a time to plan, a time to plan before uh, any Persian army made it all the way down to Laconia. I believe that hoping for the mutual destruction of the Persian and Athenian armies, Sparta sent Pheidippides north again with the message that its forces would be on their way, but just as soon as the Carnea was complete. <laughs> it is important to note that this is simply my own kind of cynical way of looking at things. I am a native New Yorker, so I do have a cynical kind of outlook on human nature, but based on what I I can see of of the Spartans and human nature for that matter, um, and given the fact that there are many other plausible reasons, this cannot be discounted, I think, as to why the Spartans may have wanted a delay. Multiple sources, including Plato, Strabo, Pausanias, mention another Mycenaean revolt, Uh, that was going on around this time. Uh, It was apparently unsuccessful. And scholars have even questioned this since there is little mention of it, particularly in Herodotus. But if we accept these kind of shadowy accounts in Plato, Strabo, and Pausanias, uh, then Sparta was possibly involved in yet another struggle to keep the helots under its thumb. And the problem was bad enough that their army could not be spared. In the end... Therefore, this small force of Plataeans, Plataea is, this, is in Boeotia, as you can see here, just to the north of the Attic uh, Peninsula. Um, this small contingent of Plataeans marched with the Athenian hoplites to Marathon. Um, now, today, the word marathon simply means a long distance race because, uh, well, as as I'm going to get to that in a moment, actually, as to why that is. But in the ancient world, um, the term uh, marathon actually came from the word for fennel, which was this kind of um, uh, grass that grew abundantly on the plain where the Persians beached their ships and deployed their troops at what is now going to be one of the uh, most famous battles in the entire uh, Persian War. The plain of Marathon was flat, broad and perfect for the Persian cavalry, who would have plenty of room to maneuver. We should remember the success the Thessalian cavalry had enjoyed against the first Spartan expedition to Athens. Mounted men on good ground could be devastating against a hoplite phalanx, presumably because they could ride around the formation and attack its vulnerable flanks and rear. And the Persians would have known this because with them came Hippias, that remember that Athenian tyrant that had been ousted by Cleomenes and the Spartans some years earlier. And it was this now this old man, 
but was present to resume his tyranny on behalf of Darius and to rule Athens as kind of a Persian puppet, basically making him kind of a, um, a satrap of maybe a new province of Greece. Now, what strengths did the Persian army have going into battle? Persia, as I said before, was a vast empire, many times the size of Greece, and composed of subject peoples of varying languages, ethnicities, and cultures, all of which were reflected in the army. So the Persians, as we label them, were actually made up of Iranians, Bactrians, Scythians, Egyptians, Phoenicians, Medes, Hyrcanians, and others. There is a tendency to impose uniformity on ancient militaries. Uh, it is likely that such a diverse army had diverse equipment, though. The Scythians, for example, were known to use light hand axes, but there are some general features worth mentioning. Most scholars believe that while there were very likely subject Greeks fighting on uh, as hoplites in the Persian army, most Persian troops didn't wear bronze armor. Instead of helmets, most Persian infantry would have worn something called a tiara. Yes, that same word for the jeweled headdress of women's fashion. But in Persian dress, it meant a cloth hood that could be pulled over the face to keep out dust. The few Persians who did wear body armor would have worn linen or leather cuirasses, that is kind of like a thing for one's chest. Um, sometimes these would have been covered with bronze scales. They also, by and large, didn't use thick wooden shields in the manner of the Greeks. Instead, they used light wickerwork shields made of cane and rawhide, either small crescent-shaped shields or huge rectangular ones. Once again, this is the majority view. There are scholars who believe that at least the elite Persians wore more and better armor than they are usually credited with. But let's proceed with the majority view, which has the Persians largely unarmored. This near total lack of armor may make it seem like the Persians were defenseless, but it makes more sense when you consider that the Persians did not expect to close ranks with their enemies. They were first and foremost archers, masters of the wood, sinew, and horn composite bow, which had much greater power and range than the simple Greek self-bow made of a single flexible piece of wood. The Persians faced their enemies by placing a Sparabara, this is the ancient Iranian word, the shield bearer, carrying the door sized rectangular spara shield, which they set on the ground and took position behind with a spear. Around nine ranks of archers would line up behind the shield bearer and keep up an absolutely withering rain of arrows until they judged the enemy weakened enough to be charged for close combat. These tactics had all worked well enough for the Persians to conquer a vast empire. And when they advanced a marathon, they, I think, were confident that it would work here as well. Another important note in the nature of Persian uh, military is their arrows themselves. Xenophon tells us of Cretan archers improving their range by shooting Persian-made arrows at a high trajectory. Persian arrow shafts were made of light reeds, and their arrowheads were both smaller and lighter than the Cretans. Such arrows serve very well when one is fighting against other lightly armored opponents, such as Scythians, Egyptians, Indians, and Mesopotamians, whom the Persians conquered to build their empire. But they are much less effective against an enemy covered nearly head to toe in bronze armor and carrying a heavy, thick wooden shield. There is a famous quote from Herodotus that we will learn about later on, uh, just before the Battle of Thermopylae that we will discuss today, uh, where one of the Spartans, a man named Dionysus, um, says, he is told by the Persians, lay down your weapons now. We have so many arrows that they will blot out the sun. And Dionysus says, good, then we will have our fight in the shade. Now, whether or not this exchange ever actually occurred is besides the point. The Spartans, you know, had a reputation for laughing in the face of death. But I'd like to just look at it from another point of view. Dionysius, if it did indeed, uh, if he did actually say that, he may have been informed by the Athenian experience at Marathon that light Persian arrows were largely ineffective against a fully armored Greek hoplite holding his shield on high. And so uh, th that is another way of looking at those, um, you know, those exact, uh, uh, you know, same same words, but looking at them from a different point of view. One more note on the Persians, Herodotus describes a training regimen 
uh, at least among the Persian nobility, that seems every bit as tough as the Spartan uh, Agoge. Persian aristocrats were trained in riding, handling the spear and bow, swimming and running, weathering the elements and standing long watches. Persian nobles were expected to be warriors and clearly trained arduously for that role. We don't have nearly the same detail as we do for the Spartan regimen, but from what we do see, it seems that a Persian noble would be at least something of a match, at least in training, maybe even, I am hesitant to say an equal, but something approaching an equal of his Spartan counterpart. Um, we have to keep in mind that the Spartan homoioi were certainly an elite mi uh, minority. It would be inviting, I think, too much of a semantic fight to call them the equivalent of Persian nobles. But it is clear that the elites of both societies were very highly trained and very, very highly militarized. Now, at the Battle of Marathon, the, Pol the Athenian Polemarchus, that is the kind of archon in charge of military matters, was a man named Callimachus. But also present were the ten strategoi, that is the ten generals, these professional generals that had been instituted by Cleisthenes in 508 BC. So Marathon was really the first major test of these new officials. The problem, of course, is that too many chefs spoil the sauce. Some of the ten generals had different ideas from the others about the strategy that should be followed. Half of them, we, we are told by Herodotus, were in favor of waiting for the full moon when the Spartan festival to Apollo would be over and the, the Spartans would then, uh, you know, they had promised their help would arrive at that point. The other half of the strategoi wanted to attack sooner, perhaps to try to catch the Persians unawares. And then, there, of course, there was the archon Polemarchus, Callimachus, uh, who was in favor of, uh, well, he didn't really know what to do at first, actually. He was kind of torn between the two. He was the commander-in-chief. He did have authority over the ten strategoi. Which side would he go to? Well, in the end, one of the strategoi, the strategos Miltiades, a very famous name in ancient Athenian history, Miltiades was one of the strategoi, and he was allowed to plan the strategy and direct operations. And because of this, he won Marathon for the Athenians. Miltiades was a member of a very prominent family known as the Filiada, uh, one of the oldest and wealthiest in Athens. The future um, uh, historian Thucydides will come from this family. Uh, Miltiades was himself actually the nephew of the same Miltiades that was sent by Pisistratus as governor to the Thracian Chernesis region uh, back in 545, if you remember from a previous lecture. And Miltiades, uh, the nephew, had lived up in, in, in the uh, Thracian Chern Chernesis for some time before he returned to Athens. And he got back to Athens in about 493. So three years later, we find him as Stratagos and ready to play an integral part in Athenian military affairs. How did he wrest control from Callimachus and the other Stratagoi and direct the Athenians and Plataeans to attack as they did? Well, what he did was to make an impassioned speech to Callimachus, the Archon Polemarchus. And Herodotus gives us a rendition of this. This, by the way, is one of the other aspects of Herodotus that has to be taken with a good deal, of, a good grain of salt, because, you know, uh, obviously the, there was some speech that was that took place here, but the renditions that are presented inside of these, that is a whole uh, aspect of ancient historiography. They all, all the ancient historians have speeches inside of their works, but um, to a large degree, their kind of prose composition. <laughs> They're just sort of, you know, uh, whatever the author kind of makes, makes them out to be. That's a whole another question. We'll deal with that more when we talk about Thucydides. But Herodotus does give us a rendition of this speech that Miltiades gave. And in it, Miltiades urged Callimachus to attack the Persians immediately. He said that the fate of Athens and Greece was in Callimachus's hands, and that if he kept dilly-dallying, the Greeks as a whole would lose faith in him, and they would submit to the Persians, and it would all be over. But, says Miltiades, with the gods' help, they would win the battle. All of this depends on you, says Miltiades to Callimachus, according to Herodotus, that is. All hangs on your decision now. This was really putting Callimachus on the spot, and Callimachus folded. He perhaps folded because he was influenced to a large extent by another line that Miltiades ran by him. Herodotus says that Miltiades said to him, Callimachus, 
in your hands right now are the means to make Athens enslaved or free and to leave to all mankind forever a memorial to yourself, the sort that not even Harmodius and Aristogiton left. And of course, we all know what that one was, right? Harmodius and Aristogiton were the slayers of Hipparchus. Okay, they were remembered as sort of like this archetypal freedom fighter. They were like the kind of Paul Revere or you know Patrick Henry and Nathan Hale, something like that um, of uh, of ancient Greece. These were the people that, in the mythologized version of the story, had rid uh, Athens of tyranny. Okay, they had been the tyrant slayers. So he's summoning up this very strong ethical appeal. Now. The um, all this dithering, though, on the part of Callimachus, uh, finally uh, came to an end. But it had taken five days, actually. And uh, the uh, the army of the Persians was was encamped. They had disembarked, and they were and they were waiting for the Greeks to join battle. But for five days, nothing happened. Neither army seemed to be willing to make the first move. The Greeks were probably worried about the vast disparity in numbers, and the Persians were probably nervous to attack a hoplite phalanx dug in on higher ground. We can't be sure why the Greeks did finally sound the advance, um, and there are multiple hypotheses. The prevailing theory is that the Greeks' hand was forced when the Persians elected to disembark some ships uh, loaded with troops to make an end run around the Athenian position and to disembark an army right outside of Athens. There were, was even worry about pro-Persian factions inside the city, opening the gates to welcome them. Another theory is that this Enron force was composed of the Persian cavalry, because ancient accounts of the battle don't mention the Persian cavalry at all. Um, and we'll talk also about that later on. But this would take away one of the Persians' most critical advantages and give, give it the Greeks the confidence they needed to take the fight to the enemy. I don't like that theory because it rests on the frankly kind of um, foolish theme in so much scholarship of the, on the Greco-Persian wars that assumes the Persians were foolish. They were stupid. They were not. Um, uh, they, uh, this is something that, um, you know, the, the Persian cavalry uh, would not have been simply kind of let to sort of uh, let let out to pasture, as it were, and taken away from this important battle. That would be a very foolish move, and I don't think the Persians would have done so. Uh, they were not deployed, it seems, on the battlefield, but we'll talk about why later on. Whatever the reason, the Greek force finally did advance at a run, trusting to their bronze armor and heavy shields to protect them from the light Persian arrows. This proved to be a good bet and the Persians very likely were beginning to feel the sick tinge of panic in their guts when the Greeks smashed into their line like a runaway truck. In close combat, lack of good armor was only one of several Persian disadvantages. They also used shorter, lighter spears with spherical counterbalances, as opposed to the Greek butt spike, uh, which meant that if the spearhead was snapped off, the weapon was useless. Again, there is a minority view that the Persian spears were not shorter, but we're going to go with the majority view here. Apart from the light hand axes that I mentioned before, uh, most Persian infantry would have been armed with a light, straight-bladed long knife. There would have been other weapons as well, but against the hoplite's long, heavy thrusting spear, the doru, and uh, a hoplite's leaf-bladed xiphos, or cleaver-like sword, or not really cleaver-like, but kind of almost machete-like sword, uh, the Persians were clearly outmatched. In order to stretch their line and prevent themselves from being outflanked, the Greeks had thinned their center, which immediately ran into trouble facing the Persians' best troops, the Iranians and Scythians, who probably had the best equipment out of the army. However, the deeper formation of the Greek flanks won out and then swung inward to envelop the Persians on two sides. The Persians, suddenly finding themselves having to fight in two directions at once, broke and fled, granting the Athenians and Plataeans one of the most legendary upset victories in military history. If we are to believe Herodotus, over 6,000 Persians were killed at a cost of roughly just 200 Greeks. 
Of course, that still left over 20,000 Persian troops who had managed to flee the battlefield and disembark on their ships. Um, these set sail for Athens and the Greek troops raced for home, reaching the city just before the soldiers with the Persian fleet. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and of course, the first person to make it back was uh, was a runner. Some say it was Pheidippides, but it might not have been him. Uh, he ran back to the city of, of Athens, announcing the great victory with a single word, a word that has become immortalized in American footwear, Nike, uh, the Greek, word, Greek pronunciation would be Nike, uh, which means victory, and then we are told he dropped dead. Okay, But that is where the origin of the marathon actually comes from. The fact that a marathon is whatever that is, 24 miles, 26 miles, something like that. Is precisely the distance from the plain of Marathon to the city of Athens. Now, we have to at least mention one minority view. Some scholars question the story of, of, the, of the Athenians racing back to Athens um, to go in and kind of head off the Persians who were then going there by boat, um, because uh, Apparently, they were not in such a hurry to reach Athens that they didn't stop off to pick up uh, the prisoners from Eretria. Okay, that is, remember, the, 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 the Eretrians would have still been there, the, the captives that had been taken by the Persians, they would have still been, uh, been there. And apparently, they didn't do that. So, whatever the case of that may be, the Athenians were definitely still binding their wounds and blinking in astonishment, I think, at their surprise victory over the um, uh, over the Persians, when 2,000 Spartans, if Herodotus again is giving us the correct number, finally showed up at Athens' gate, ready to pitch in and do their part in battle, um, that they were you know, now prepared to fight. But the battle was over. The, the Persians had been repulsed. Athens and Plataea had stood up to one of the greatest empires in the ancient world. This was a shock, I think, that um, uh, that was you know so... Um, was so mighty for the Greeks uh, that uh, that there really was no kind of um, you know nothing really to compare it to. In fact, the uh, there is all sorts of amazingly you know over the top heroic stories that Milti that Herodotus gives us. For instance, the brother of Aeschylus was one of the people who was fighting, and as they drove the Persians back into the water, back into their boats to get on. One of his arms is chopped off, and so he continues to fight on with the other arm. And then that one gets chopped off. And when the Persian boat is leaving, he grips it with his teeth uh, so to prevent them from trying to leave. It's almost like that Monty Python skit in the Quest for the Holy Grail, if you're familiar with that one. Um, but whatever the case of all of that over-the-top kind of heroism might be, the fact of the matter is, is that this battle was so... Um, uh, was, was was so poignant. This victory was so poignant in the Greek imagination. From then on, the people who fought at it were known as the Marathon Omakoi, the men who fought at Marathon. They were like the supreme heroes, kind of like what we call the best generation in, uh, you know, referring to the Americans who fought at World War II. Aeschylus himself survived that battle, the great playwright. And many, many years later, even though he would go on to write some of the greatest works of literature of all time, the Oresteia, many others, he was he's one of the uh, greatest of, of all playwrights up there with Sophocles and Euripides and Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, But yet, when he died, he wrote his own uh, epitaph for his death, and it simply says, he doesn't mention any of that stuff, any of all the, the plays and literary fame that he won. He just says, "Here lies Mar uh, here lies Aeschylus, the son of Euphorion, the long-haired Persian at Marathon knows his courage well." Very, very poignant and beautiful sentiment. Now, to an extent, the Persians' ineptitude had contributed to their own defeat because they hadn't reconnoitered the territory properly. And this is now the question about the, the cavalry: Why weren't the cavalry deployed there? Why aren't they? Uh, uh, why didn't they take part in the battle? They were, would have been so effective against the hoplites. You see, the plain of Marathon had a good deal of swampy ground around it, uh, where the plain hits the water. And the Persians had disembarked their cavalry onto it, and bogged down as the uh, in that as the cavalry became bogged down, it was rendered ineffective because horses really aren't capable of being deployed on swampy terrain. And that's why Marathon was simply an, an infantry engagement, not a cavalry one. In all likelihood, the outcome could have been very different had the Persian cavalry 
operated properly because the Persian cavalry was first rate. Its infantry, as we've seen, was not uh, as first rate, but the cavalry was. So the Persians then contributed to their own defeat at Marathon because they landed the cavalry uh, where it couldn't be deployed. And that was exactly the edge that Miltiades needed. At the same time, though, we must not begrudge the Athenians their victory. Although the Persian army was not um, uh, uh, totally beaten, um, it definitely had been bloodied. Herodotus, as I said before, gives us those numbers of over 6,000 Persians to less than 200 Athenians. In fact, the exact number is 192 Athenians, and we know uh, that the Athenian, uh, the, that that number actually must be correct. In fact, that number includes Callimachus, the uh, the Polymarchus Archon. Um, but the, and if that number is is correct, and and at least on the Greek side of things, it is. But that ratio of say over six thousand to one ninety two, if that ratio is correct, then that is an uh, that is an um, uh, you know uh, an astounding number. Um, it might not be totally correct on the on the Persian side of things, but it it we know actually that. Um, uh, that the number on the Greek side is correct because there is a funerary mound in, uh, in, in on the plain of Marathon. You can still go and visit it to this day. Here are pictures of it on the screen, as you see here. And the names of those people were originally listed of all the people who who died there. Okay, so they they put they buried all of the remains uh, in this one place and listed their names. So it clearly was um, a, a major battle, and it left a, an uh, an indelible mark within the Greek psyche. And it is one of those things that, um, uh, well, uh, it is. it was customary in uh, on the part of the victor in ancient Greek battles to dedicate spoils from the, uh, from the battle to the gods. And Miltiades was no different. He dedicated his spoils to Zeus at Olympia. And these can be seen in the fantastic museum at Olympia to this day. Uh, if you ever go to Greece, it is a great museum, and I definitely recommend that you see it. Included among the spoils that he dedicated to Zeus was his armor and his helmet, and it had his name inscribed on it. And that is how we know it is Miltiades. If you read Greek letters, you can see it here at the bottom of the screen, Miltiades. And as you look on the helmet today, when you go to the museum, you can see his name clearly written on it, and history really comes alive. You can just imagine, you know, as you stand next to the glass display cabinet, but you're only a few inches away from what is inside that cabinet. And it's incredibly moving when you see that name incised upon it, to think that this was the man who defeated the Persians at Marathon, that put this helmet on his head on that day, and then dedicated it to the gods. History comes alive, as I say, when these things happen, and it does really give you goosebumps. And so then, the invincible Persian army had been beaten by the Greek hoplite army. Without the Spartans' help, the Athenians and the Plataeans only had done it. And to use modern parlance, this was huge. Okay, The Battle of Marathon became one of the most significant events in Athenian history for what it symbolized and how it came to be portrayed. Because it came to be portrayed as an Athenian victory that saved Greece. Forget the role that the Plataeans had in it. The battle, as I say, gave us this new word for, in Greek vocabulary, the Marathon Omakoi, the fighters of Marathon. These men were regarded as heroes, and long after they were dead, their memories would be invoked in political and judicial speeches as examples of patriots who stood firm against a barbarian foe. How everyone should be like them, uh, how they were the kind of best people. And I'm going to pick up on this point in later time when we uh, complete our analysis of the archaic period and we move on to the classical. We will revisit the, uh, the, the Battle of Marathon at this time. I see Marathon as Athens coming of age as a military power. This is not something, though, that would have gone well, down well with the Spartans, would it? They did send help when their festival to Apollo had ended, but it arrived too late, as I said before. It, it actually arrived the day after the Battle of Marathon, um, which, for me, that would be the time I would like to arrive at any battle, but, <laughs> but that's not the point. These are the Spartans we're talking about. And I think that inwardly the Spartans must have been miffed at the result. They might boast the best and uh, toughest army on Greek on the Greek mainland, but um, despite that, and despite the fact that they headed the Peloponnesian League, 
uh, you know, and had done so since the middle of the sixth century, they, and they had this intense international reputation. Nevertheless, the Persian, the, the Persians were now beat by the Athenians and not by them, and on Greek soil. This is something that the Spartans had not done. And nobody, I think, would have expected the Athenians to do this either. So the underdog really shines here. The Athenian victory at Marathon would not have sat well with the Spartans, as I said, by a long shot. And we therefore move from Athens as a growing economic and cultural center, both things which the Spartans were not, to Athens as a growing military power with distinguished hoplites, the Marathon Omakoi. The Athenians relished this, as can be seen in their new air of confidence in the city. Just three years later, in the year 487, they held their first ostracism, for example. That, uh, I will come to that um, uh, in our next lecture. I'll explain why that is a, um, a sign. Actually, no, I'm sorry, later on tonight. Um, and I'll explain why that is a sign of their newfound confidence. In the meantime, though, the Persians had scampered out of Greece their tails between their legs. And uh, that was the end of their big invasion. Okay, So ends 490 BC with the Athenians euphoric and everyone talking about these Marathon of McCoy. As I said, if we were betting people, we would have had made a fortune uh, on, on that day on, by betting on the Athenians because nobody would have expected it. But the big question now was, really two or three questions. First of all, what would Darius do next? Was he simply going to allow his Persian troops to have been defeated on Greek on the Greek mainland and say, well, there's nothing else I can do. I'm getting out of here. Uh, or, second question, would he come back? And if he would, when would he come back if he wasn't going to allow the Persian defeated marathon to pass with, without some form of retribution? As we're going to see, he wouldn't do anything himself, actually, because Darius would die in the year 486. And the Persian throne then passed to his son Xerxes. This is the famous Xerxes um, uh, of the later Persian Wars. Xerxes, we're going to see, was faced with all sorts of problems when he first became king. Um, and he would uh, he would be bogged down in those things. But he would ultimately launch a massive invasion of Greece in 481. And it was really huge. Uh, and we're going to talk all about that uh, uh, But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about the impact of the Battle of Marathon on Athenian politics back home. The Athenian victory at Marathon had dramatic repercussions in the city. Until Marathon, the Alcmeonidae family had dominated Athenian politics, as Cleisthenes had intended, if you remember. We made that point in our lecture on Cleisthenes, that in redistributing the local power bases within Attica, he essentially left those of his own family, the Alcmeonidae, alone. That meant that the family could continue to dominate political life because its power bases remained in and around Athens, where the assembly, the ecclesia, was meeting. Until Marathon, though, as I said, the Alcmeonidae had dominated Athenian politics. But the Persian issue, especially the Battle of Marathon itself, brought about a change in foreign policy. It became anti-Persian. With it, there came a, a change in political leadership, too a change that eclipsed the power of the Alcmeonidae. This confidence, if you like, could be seen in the people who were now prepared to hold their leaders accountable for their actions and not left them off, as seems to have been the case in the past. One glaring example of the people now being prepared to hold their leaders accountable is Miltiades himself, the hero of Marathon. We might think that Miltiades would dominate political life for ages now, but this wasn't the case. Not long after Marathon, Miltiades was involved in a costly overseas adventure. Uh, he was gravely wounded in it as well. We don't have to go into the details of that. Uh, but the point is that the Athenians find him when he returned to Athens, uh, and he, but he died before he could pay the fine. And his son, Chimon, had to uh, ultimately discharge the debt. Uh, in Athens, uh, I'll just mention, it was customary for children to inherit the debts of their fathers and to pay them back to the state. Uh, if they could not do this very often, in certain cases, fines were doubled. Uh, the Athenians were not prepared to let anyone off 
who died in debt to the state. And this actually was, uh, law, laws like this were actually uh, a part of European society until rather recently. Mercifully in America uh, and, and in most of the Western world, we don't have anything like that anymore. But it was the case that at one point, debts would be inherited by children. Uh, that still, you can kind of make a case that is still the case if a person dies with a lot of debt, the state can be taxed or, you know, to, uh, the creditors can try to get the money back from the state, but it's not quite the same thing. Anyway, that's just one example. Uh, another example of the new confidence on the part of the people is the first recorded instance of ostracism in 488 BC. And I mentioned this earlier. This procedure of ostracism had been introduced by Cleisthenes in 508 BC. Uh, you remember it was meant to be a safeguard to the constitution. It was a means of basically getting rid of anyone who was uh, believed to be attempting to subvert the democracy. And why is it a sign now that they were that the first recorded instance of ostracism uh, now takes place in 48? Why is that a sign of confidence? It is a sign of confidence in the people because uh, if the Alcmeonida had been controlling political power as much during these years as it had since the time of Cleisthenes legislation in 508, uh, that would not have taken place, you see. It is a sign that the people are, ex are exerting their power to make decisions within the state independently of this powerful ruling family. That period of Alcmeonidae dominance from 508 to, say, 4 490, and the, where the Battle of Marathon took place, uh, that period of dominance was now over. Now the people were prepared to put their foot down and say, no, we've had enough of this. We now want to start exiling leaders that we disagree with. We now want to start finding leaders who have proved to be corrupt or inept. So the Alcmeonidae could not control the people anymore. And ostracism is a wonderful example of that. From 487 down until 484 BC, ostracism was used to get uh, rid of pro-Persian leaders. Um, so anybody who was kind of taking a moderate stance or even a favorable stance towards Persia, they were gotten rid of. And so you can see why I said before that foreign policy now became anti-Persian. Anybody who was in favor of amicable relations with the Persians or of brokering some kind of diplomatic contact could now find himself ostracized. Another interesting change, as far as constitutional history is concerned, is that in the year 487 BC, the same year as the first uh, recorded, uh, well, just, just after the first recorded ostracism, archons began to be chosen by lot. They were chosen by lot from a pool that was put forward by various tribes uh, in just the same way as the tribes chose members for the boule. We don't know how large the pool was, but it must have been an even number because of the 10 tribes. The upshot was that more men now could stand for the archonship. And with uh, it being done by lot, they had much more of a chance of being elected uh, just as much as the next man, effectively. At the same time, the people made sure that men who were put forward could do the job. Each candidate was subject to a preliminary test called a dokimasia. And at this dokimasia, or scrutinizing this period of questioning, uh, the candidate for the archonship had to answer various questions. These questions were not just about his qualifications for the job, but also about his lifestyle. Did he have legitimate children? Had he buried, buried his parents uh, in the with all decorum and, and religious scruple if they were dead? Um, did he own land within the borders? Um, in other words, that is within the borders of Attica. So there's a kind of moral element now coming into it. Uh, so in addition to having the right qualifications, you also had to have uh, and had to lead the right lifestyle. Why the change to election by lot? Uh, the answer is that thanks to Marathon, people now became aware of just how important the role of strategos general was. Once strategoi, that is the plural of strategos, crossed over into the political arena of the ecclesia, of the assembly, and they began advising on political affairs, then competition for this office increased dramatically. And it increased dramatically because of the power that the strategos could wield. 
Uh, remember, this is the one office that is open to re-election any number of times, unlike the archonships. So naturally, the Strategos diluted the power of the archons and by extension of the Areopagus. A sign of the times was the Athenian term for politician that now begins to come into usage. This fact strikes us as a little bit strange, really, here, the Athenians now invent democracy, but they didn't actually have a word, a single word for politician. They did have a number of words, actually, but the most common term that the Athenians used for what we would call politician from this time now onwards was the phrase retores kai strategoi, orators and generals. Okay, so you see that general now became part of the phrase for politician. One of the greatest of the Athenian leaders, the most anti-Persian of them all, was a fellow named Themistocles. And you're going to be hearing a lot about him from now on. In 493 BC, he had served as Archon. And during that time, he had the Piraeus, that is the natural kind of port and harbor city of Athens. He had the Piraeus fortified. Then 10 years later, in the year 483 BC, he persuaded the people to spend a budget surplus on building a hundred new triremes. Okay, the trireme, of course, was the main um, warship for uh, the, uh, for the Greeks, and uh, you, you see a picture of one in front of you now. And it, the reason why uh, was that in this year, 483, the Athenians had produced so much silver from one of their mines in, at Laurium, uh, which is in the southeast uh, of Attica. Um, these are mines, you remember, that they had only started to exploit effectively during the uh, latter part of the Pisistratid tyranny. Uh, they had such a big surplus of it that uh, they didn't know what to do with it. So one of the politicians of the time, Aristides, one of the commanders of the Greek center at Marathon, actually, he proposed to the Athenians that they simply divvy up the surplus equally among all citizens, kind of like, you know, um, I don't know, stimulus checks or something like that. And the Athenians thought, well, that's not a bad idea. But then someone had the bright idea of asking the Apollo, uh, uh, the Oracle of Apollo at Delphi, what to do. And his answer, as was typical of these oracles, was very cryptic. He said that the Athenians needed to place their safety in their wooden wall, clear as mud. <laughs> what does it mean to place one's safety in their wooden wall? Well, Themistocles interpreted this oracular pronouncement as meaning that, of course, the Athenians were to use the surplus to build not an actual wooden wall around the city, oh, pasha, uh, but rather the wooden hulls of ships. In other words, the wooden wall is the hull of the ship, and this is what we have to put our, our, our trust in, in our safety, and uh, the, our making a big fleet. And the people thought, well, that sounds pretty good. Let's do that. That sounds even better than giving out stimulus checks. And so as a result, a hundred new triremes were built. The trireme became the standard Greek warship. It was rowed by 170 rowers sitting in three banks of oars on each side. Uh, hence its name trireme, trireme meaning three. Uh, despite its size, it was very slick to maneuver. Um, and it was somewhere between 120, perhaps 150 feet long, about 18 to 20 feet wide or so. Its job was to ram enemy ships and to sink them, because attached to the prow of the trireme was a reinforced curved bronze hook, um, for lack of a better word, a big beak, essentially. And, um, uh, and this thing, the trireme then smashed broadside into an enemy vessel. The hook would make a big hole in the enemy's uh, hull. And then the trireme would pull back, and of course, water would flow into the enemy ship and sink it. That was the idea. Sometimes, of course, the front of the trireme was hooked so tightly into the enemy vessel that it couldn't disengage. And when that happened, there would be maybe some hand-to-hand -hand fighting, soldiers jumping from one trireme onto another until one got the upper hand and the ship could be separated. Uh, and there was also a kind of technique that the Athenians developed called a periplus, or a sailing around, where they got so good at this, they would train with it uh, in time that they would come up right alongside the enemy vessel, pull all of their oars in uh, to their side, and then saw off the enemy's oars on one side. So obviously a ship with no oars is basically like a sitting duck. 
Um, and uh, so all in all, naval warfare was not a pleasant business, but it really became kind of like the specialty of, Athen of the Athenians in time. It all begins here. And this move by Themistocles of persuading the Athenians to build a hundred new triremes laid the foundations for the later naval victories over the Persians that we're going to discuss tonight. Uh, this also paved the way for Athens to become the leading naval force in Greece and then to put together an empire, but we're going to get to all of that uh, later on. The point to mention here, though, is that nat the nature of warfare was changing quickly now. Infantry battles were still necessary, yes, but so also were naval battles, as the Battle of Lade had shown at the end of the Ionian Revolt, and as the battles uh, that we're going to learn about tonight uh, will also show during the Persian Wars. After the Persians defeated Marathon, Herodotus, Herodotus tells us that Darius was bent on revenge. Although, as I said before, we'll have to wait 10 years before the Persians again sail into the Aegean. In 486 BC, as I said before, Darius died, and he was succeeded by his son, Xerxes. Xerxes, however, almost immediately was faced with problems in Egypt over increased taxation, and he had to deal with those first. It was only when the Egyptian problem was solved and uh, that uh, Xerxes felt sufficiently secure on the Persian throne that he could turn his attention properly to Greece. And so it was in 481 BC that the time finally came. Herodotus states specifically that Xerxes intended to conquer all Greece and that he sent messengers seeking earth and water to, hit to this effect. By now, 481, news had certainly reached the Greeks of the great fleet that Xerxes was preparing. He had been levying money for this for the last year or so. Um, and, and now it was ready. Uh, it's, this wasn't completely unknown to the Greeks. They did realize that this was uh, going to take place at some time in the near future. And a number of uh, Greek states submitted almost immediately to Persia. This is what the technical term for this is Medizing. This is the, the, the Greeks called the Persians Medes. And so any state that kowtowed to Persia that gave in was said to have Medized. That is, they became pro-Persian. And a number of those became, a number of the city-states became pro-Persian as soon as these messengers from Xerxes arrived, demanding earth and water, because the news uh, that he was coming uh, was, you know, so horrifying to them. And finally, he did come. In the year 481, Xerxes finally mustered his army and fleet, wintering them in Lydia on modern-day Turkey's west coast. Uh, this happened due to storms destroying the bridges he had constructed across the Hellespont, the Dardanelles, this narrow strait that separates Europe from Turkey. A second bridge was therefore constructed from ships lashed together and a massive uh, invasion preparation program was undertaken, including the laying in of supply depots along the army's projected path, the construction of roads, and the digging of a canal through the peninsula of Mount Athos to allow ships to transit without exposing them to the storms that had scuttled the first invasion attempt, you remember, in 492. If these preparations seem extensive, it is because they were. They were also necessary, as Xerxes had assembled what was arguably the largest invasion force in history to that date. As with the army Datus commanded at Marathon, it was drawn from across the massive polyglot and diverse Persian Empire, which stretched from what is now Libya, Turkey, and Bulgaria in the west, to what is now Pakistan and Turkmenistan in the east. Xerxes had once again sent to the city-states of Greece uh, these embassies demanding earth and water, but he did not send them to Athens and Sparta. He deliberately omitted them, no doubt, because you didn't. There, there was no chance of showing them any mercy. There was no chance that they could kind of get out of what was coming. Um, Herodotus, citing an inscription from the battlefield at Thermopylae, that we're going to be learning about momentarily, notes one claim that the Persians fielded quote three hundred myriads. Now, a myriad is a Greek word meaning 10,000, which would give Xerxes the outrageous figure of 3 million troops. This is impossible. Uh, the largest 
land invasion that has ever taken place at any time in human history was Operation Barbarossa when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. And I think it was 1941, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, that was 3 million people. Okay, And that was the largest invasion force that has ever been assembled. And of course, it had all the, the you know, uh, modern day uh, logistical support, trains and planes and, and all the rest of it. And so the idea of an ancient army fielding that many people is simply impossible. Even if such a massive army could have been mustered, uh, in, even if it could have been organized and commanded, it surely could not have been fed or watered, uh, let alone transported. Herodotus, accordingly, lowers this to a more modest 1,700,000 infantry and 100,000 cavalry, which is also insane <laughs> uh, because of all these you know, logistical issues. Modern scholars debate the actual size of the army. Uh, some people have suggested 800,000 combined troops. Uh, that's a number I see repeated sometimes. This is still mind-bogglingly large, and I am certainly much more comfortable with later estimates of maybe at the max a quarter million. Okay. So 250,000 uh, combined troops. Even this, by any standard, ancient or modern, would be a staggeringly high arm, uh, high amount for an army. Um, Herodotus gives the also surely false anecdote that Xerxes's army drank whole rivers dry. Uh, so I align with the minority view that the Persian force was larger than most ancient armies of the period, but probably not a whole lot more than 100,000. Uh, troops total. Herodotus and modern scholars both are incentivized to exaggerate the size of the Persian army. The biggest army ever makes the story seem more important, more dramatic, and thus more likely to attract a larger and more enthusiastic audience, which of course was Herodotus's whole kind of thing, in a sense, that was, that was a motivation that we cannot forget. We will never really know the exact size of the army, but uh, Surely it was enormous, the biggest army in the known world at that time, and easily large enough to roll over any opposition force in Greece. According to Herodotus, the army was so enormous that it took seven full days and nights to trans transit the, the bobbing makeshift pontoon bridge across the Hellespont. Uh, Xerxes surely advanced into Europe, confident that absolutely no one could stop him. Uh, Certainly, nobody was going to prevent him from crushing this meddlesome terrorist state in the West. He would put an end to the independence of these backward barbarians who, according to the Persian Zoroastrian belief, advocated the lie in the face of the truth of Ahura Mazda, the patron deity of Zoroastrianism. Whether or not the Persian invasions of Greece constituted a religious war, is also hotly debated um, uh, by scholars. The sources certainly do indicate that both Darius and Xerxes saw the replacement of the lie with Ahura Mazda's truth as a motivating factor. However much uh, of a factor it was, though it is not clear, certainly impossible to prove. Um, we should remember that among the many Greeks accompanying the Persians, was the exiled Spartan king Demaratus, chased from his home by the scheming of Cleomenes and Laotychides. He was a critical military and cultural advisor to Xerxes, especially on matters pertaining to the Spartans. Interestingly enough, the movie from which this picture on the left comes, the 300, he is omitted from that movie, although he does make an appearance in the 1962 movie of uh, the 300 Spartans, which is not bad. You, could, you should watch it if you get the chance. Um, and uh, apparently, well, whatever the case of that may be, the army was paralleled by a massive invasion fleet that could provide communications, supply, and transport its men. It had apparently over 1,300 triremes, according to Herodotus, supplied and crewed by Xerxes, his seafaring subjects, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Cypriots, the Ionians, and other Greek islanders. And uh, one of the ways that we know so much about these the, the triremes and how they were used is that a group of Englishmen in the 1980s actually developed and, uh, and actually built uh, a reproduction of them. That was the picture that I showed you a moment ago. There it is again. It is known as the Olympias. And uh, 
these uh, uh, and, you, and it's it still is a, a seagoing vessel. You can actually uh, go see videos of it on on YouTube, and um, um, it's, it's the American School in Athens actually still takes students out on it uh, to this day. Now, in the face of the Persian onslaught, all of the Athenian exiles were recalled in 481 BC. All of those people who had been ostracized in the past or sent away from the city for other reasons, including those ostracized in previous years, like Aristides, uh, who is now back on the scene. Ostracisms did not stop. It is very interesting. The Athenian constitution tells us that people who were ostracized now had to live close to the city of Athens, just in case they were needed. And if they chose not to live close to the city of Athens, then, again, in the words of the Athenian constitution, quote, they would be completely outlawed. End quote. Presumably, this means that they would never be allowed to return to the to the city to live, even after the ten year period of ostracism ended. In the meantime, though, the Spartans called a meeting of the Greek states at Corinth to discuss strategy, and they also wanted to create an alliance against Persia as well. In relation to this meeting or conference, it is interesting that Herodotus talked about the Spartans summoning states that were quote still loyal to the general cause. End quote. This qualification reminds us that a lot of states had already Medized. So not all of the Greeks were loyal to the Greek cause. Some of them were already clearly pro-Persian. Herodotus goes on to tell us that this conference had the aim of patching up quarrels among the various states. And that once again, this reveals the fundamental weakness of the Polis system. You shouldn't have to patch up quarrels in the face of an invasion, a, an existential crisis. But nevertheless, they had to. This conference agreed to do five things. The first one, to make pledges of loyalty against Persia and against those Greek states that had Medes. Two, to try to end the enmity between participants in the alliance. Three, to send embassies to powerful states that had not turned up. Nothing really came out of that one, just to spoil it. Four, to send spies into Asia to find out what Xerxes was up to. And finally, five, and this isn't in Herodotus, but we know, it, know of it from other sources, to decide who was going to be the overall commander of the Greek forces. Some 31 states turned up to this meeting, and they formed an alliance that modern-day historians call the Hellenic League. You'd think that given the threat to the mainland from Xerxes' enormous army, which was pretty much in Greece by now, the Greeks would have been quick to unite, but far from it. That last item, to decide who was going to be the overall commander, that was the one that caused the massive problem. The Spartans, of course, said we should be the commanders because we've got the toughest, best land army in Greece. We've got the best trained forces. We head the Peloponnesian League, for goodness sake. But the Athenians, of course, hooked their thumbs in their belts and said, but we defeated the Persians at Marathon. It looked, therefore, like a stalemate until the Athenians backed down and they agreed that Sparta would be in command of the Greek force. A Spartan general named Eurybiades was made commander-in-chief of all the League's land and naval forces. The Hellenic League strategy was clear. To stand up against such a massive army was insane, and there was no sense in looking for a decisive battle. Therefore, the smart play was to close up the limited land and sea routes that Greece, because of all of its mountainous terrain and its uh, constant, you know, sea storms and stuff like that, all of the all of those things could help uh, prevent the Persian army's massive size from penetrating. By delaying the huge host, the Greeks could force the Persians to run out of food and water as they scoured the surrounding countryside for forage and lost ships to the inevitable rough weather off the coastline. It was a risky plan, but it was surely less risky than trying to face the Persians in the field, taking on an army that would outnumber the Greeks by at least 10 to 1. The initial choke point was the Vale of Tempe in Thessaly in northern Greece. The Hellenic League sent 10,000 hoplites under the overall command of the Spartan Euanatus to hold the pass for uh, an, uh, it was far enough nor north to save nearly all of Greece from the ravages of the invading army. They went at the invitation of the anti-Persian factions of the Thess Thessalians, 
which wanted to join forces with the Hellenic League to resist the invaders. These factions stood opposed to other Thessalians who favored submission to Xerxes. So again, we see this, this infighting, this disunity. It is worth noting here a very interesting word from Thucydides' description of the later Spartan siege of Plataea. It's, the, the word is called the Xenagoi, which literally means the leaders of foreigners, the officers in charge of Xenoi, which are foreigners. Well, this is the same Xenos that gives us the word xenophobic. Well, the word is describing in Thucydides an event more than 50 years after the period that I'm discussing right now. It is definitely possible that this arrangement existed much earlier. So keep this word in mind, and, and we'll have more on it later. The decision to try to hold the Persians off so far north may have been made not only to bring the Thessalians into the fold, but to try to spare Greece from ravaging. Remember that ancient armies survived mostly on foraging, uh, which meant begging, borrowing, requisitioning, stealing, anything that wasn't nailed down in the countryside through which they traveled. There was a reason that ancient armies rarely campaigned in the winter when troops wouldn't be able to harvest neighboring fields. Uh, soldiers acting like farmers, butchers, bakers, basically taking the crops and livestock of the localities through which they passed. There are multiple reasons given for why the Greeks didn't make their stand at Tempe. Some say the Greeks were warned off by the pro-Persian king Alexander I of Macedon, who ca cautioned the Greeks that the Persians simply couldn't be resisted. Others say that a pass by which the Greek position could be outflanked was discovered. Uh, this makes sense to me, at least, uh, since it relies on the Greeks not performing basic reconnaissance on the ground. Um, uh, uh, before uh, committing their troops. Um, but the most likely reason was that the Persian army simply moved more slowly than the Greeks had guessed, causing supply problems for the Greeks encamped at Tempe and having to forage the surrounding area to keep their troops fed. And then it bypassed their position entirely by building another road around the pass into Thessaly. Of course, technically any position can be outflanked, uh, and other scholars have suggested other theories for why the Greeks abandoned Tempe, uh, including suspicion of Thessalian loyalty and a shortage of supplies for the Greeks. But whatever the reason, the Greeks pulled back to the Isthmus of Corinth, a natural land-based choke point that would allow the Greeks to hold off an enemy army and keep the Peloponnesus safe. This obviously appealed to the Spartans and their Peloponnesian allies, but it did not appeal to the rest of the Greeks who lived in Attica, Boeotia, points north of the Isthmus, whose lands would be subjugated, uh, subjugated and plundered by the Persians. Unfortunately, this left the, the, the Thessalians little choice. If the Hellenic League would not protect them, they could do nothing other than submit to Xerxes and adopt a pro-Persian position. After Tempe, the next logical choke point to stop the Persians was in central Greece, at a place called Thermopylae, the Hot Gates, so named for the hot springs that still flow there today. The route was pretty much the only way for a land army to access Greece south of Thessaly, um, and narrowed to a tiny corridor sandwiched between the Gulf of Melis to the north and the over 4,500 foot cliffs of Mount Kalidromos, to the south. This narrow track ran for roughly four miles east-west between the east and west gates of the pass. You can visit Thermopylae to this day and walk this choke point. It's a little bit different now. The, the landscape has changed over the millennia, of course, because of uh, erosion. It's uh, not as, um, uh, as narrow as it was in those days. It's hard to imagine how narrow it must have been. Um, but in 480 BC, the shore of the Gulf was a lot closer to the cliffs. So it was, in fact, so close that Herodotus tells us that it narrowed to no more than a wagon's width at the east and west gates. It was therefore a space so narrow that just a few men with good armor and shields standing shoulder to shoulder could dig in and hold on against a numerically superior enemy. And in such 
tight quarters, superior numbers would account for nothing because you could only put so many men against the other men as were in that um, that small defile. In other words, it was tailor-made for a hoplite phalanx. And even better, about halfway between the east and west gates were the ruins of a wall built by the Phocians to hold off the, the Thessalians in a previous war. The Spartans made sure to rebuild this wall, which meant they now defended a choke point that was not only tiny, but also fortified. Here is where the Spartan mirage, however, asserts itself firmly, and we must squint hard to see into it. While academics are more skeptical, nearly every popular account that one finds deems the Spartan defense at Thermopylae to be a known suicide mission. These stories credit an oracle from Delphi saying that, quote, unless a Spartan king died, Sparta would be destroyed, end quote. This oracle, Herodotus tells us this, this oracle is taken seriously, uh, I would say, perhaps by far too many, and it is therefore accepted as fact that Leonidas, um, uh, a man over 60, marched heroically off to man this pass with the full knowledge that he would not be coming home. But again, this is more mythological than it is historical. And we have already established that the Spartans were cynical when it came to religious observance. Piousness, piety su uh, suited them on some occasions, but sacrilege suited them on other occasions. Some scholars suggest that the oracle was a later story invented to help build the Spartan myth after the battle of, uh, uh, took place and Leonidas died. And uh, that is certainly plausible. The sources are clear due to the festival of the Carnea, once again, the same festival um, that prevented the Spartans from sending any army at all to Marathon, now finds the Spartans suddenly having a very convenient excuse not to send their full army north to hold the pass, but only Leonidas and 300 of his men chosen because they have living sons. Um, uh, the, the idea, of course, being that there would be people that could carry on their name. But just think about that for a moment. It's interesting to note that the Carnea had a different prohibition this time around. <laughs> At Marathon, the Carnea meant no Spartans could march to battle. At Thermopylae, suddenly the Carnea meant that just one king and 300 homoioi could march off to battle. Even this number is suspect. The first century BC Greek historian Diodorus Siculus writes that Leonidas marched to Thermopylae at the head of a thousand Spartans. Uh, this would have been inclusive. When he, he, the, the term he uses is Lacedaemonians, so it would include both Hamoioi, full Spartiates, Perioikoi, that is those people who lived around, inferiors, those who had, you know, were, that were not Hamoioi, but were kind of of a lower rank who had failed the Agoge, and also Helots as well. So uh, Diodorus is clear that only 300 of them were homoioi, but he doesn't say who the other 700 were. They were likely this this ragtag bag of, of other people that uh, I just uh, mentioned, the perioikoi and inferiors and so on. Each homoios, each peer, was almost certainly accompanied by at least one helot. Herodotus specifically mentions them as being among the dead. Uh, and these men would have fought alongside their masters. And so either way, that's a considerable difference of manpower, isn't it? Okay, that number 300 all of a sudden has basically just kind of tripled. It's also important to note that the other Greek city-states were delayed in contributing troops by the current Olympic festival, which implies that the Spartans would be assured of additional help once that festival concluded. So the idea of a suicide mission seems difficult to imagine, really. Uh, not to say that it's even more laughable when you consider that the brave 300 men, or shall we say 1,000, were joined by large complements of allies. Herodotus tell us, tells us that 500 Tegeans, 500 Mantineans, 120 Orchomenians, uh, these are all the city-states from the region of Arcadia, uh, which is in the Peloponnesus, a uh, 1,000 Arcadians and 400 Corinthians, 200 Phliasians and 800 Mycenaeans all came along at this battle. 
And those were just the allies close to Sparta. Thebes had submitted to Persia, but the anti-Persian faction in Thebes still managed to send 400 men, probably in the hopes that the Hellenic League might kind of look favorably on this contribution and not attack Thebes afterwards for their pro-Persian stance. That didn't happen. Um, Thespiae, the city-state of Thespiae, sent 700 hoplites, nearly as many as Sparta, if we believe they sent out a 1,000. The Phocians, who lived just south of the pass, sent a 1,000 men, and the Locrians to the east sent out a 1,000 as well. So we've got a lot of men here. We don't know how all these troops were armed, but it is safe to assume that they were largely equipped as hoplites. The exact numbers are debatable, but no matter how you slice it, you no longer have 300 brave men heading off on a suicide mission. You have a tiny contingent of Spartan homoioi heading up an approximately 7,000 Greek force. 7,000 man Greek force. Nearly as many troops as mustered at Marathon, if you want to put it in those terms. And on far better ground. Yes, there was still an enormous disparity in the numbers of Greeks versus the Persians, but in the tight confines of the past, Xerxes' numerical advantage would be almost entirely neutralized. Most modern accounts of Thermopylae make the, the battle seem as if the Spartans did all the fighting alone, and they pay almost no attention to the thousands of other warriors contributing to the defense. But note the later description of Spartan Xenagoi, com commanding units of foreign troops. And by foreign, we, we would look at them all as Greeks, but they did not view each other that way. So uh, Xenoi were people from other polis. And remember Spartans, Sparta's reputation, deserved or not, as the most powerful land army in Greece. And so if you put it all together, also combined with Sparta's absolutely deserved reputation as the only truly disciplined and organized army in Greece, this all raises the possibility of a small Spartan contingent of officers and advisors leading a much larger allied army in the defense of the pass of Thermopylae. In fact, Herodotus even points out that each Greek contingent took in turn uh, its turn defending the pass, presumably giving others a turn to rest, tend to their wounds and repair their armor, sharpen their swords or whatnot. I must admit that there is no real evidence to support the Spartans acting as Xenagoi at Thermopylae, other than my suspicion based on their numbers. Herodotus's comments that the Greeks took turns in the past implies that they fought cohesively as units based on their respective city-states. Furthermore, the strength of the Spartans lay in their ability to fight together, which would be lost if they were simply acting as officers. And yet, the use of this term Xenagoi sticks with me. Modern U.S. special forces frequently work as military advisors, uh, that is, kind of de facto commanding uh, contingents, uh, overseeing allied troops in running fights around the world. We have them in Ukraine right now. Those relationships are usually based on the disparity in training and professionalism between the Americans and the other militaries. The parallel here between disciplined, organized Spartan troops and other Greek amateurs seems too obvious to completely dismiss. At any rate, if we believe Herodotus that Sparta could field 8,000 peers in four, the year 480, then Sparta had sent just 4% of its allied peers to the most critical action of the Greco-Persian War. We're looking at a well-planned, definitely non-suicide mission, therefore, a well-equipped, sufficiently manned force that had a very real expectation of holding the pass, and more importantly, its neighboring naval choke point at Artemisium, uh, at least holding it long enough to cause the Persian army to starve and begin to unwind as desertion, failure of discipline, disease, and the myriad other problems that would beset any ancient army of that size, stuck in one place long enough, began to make for themselves uh, make themselves felt. That makes a lot more sense to me than the storybook notion of a fated suicide mission driven by an oracle. In fact, Herodotus specifically mentions that more Spartans would be sent as soon as the Carnea was concluded, which meant that Leonidas marched to Thermopylae knowing that help was going to be on the way. Also, um, recall my previous mentioning about the delay of other Greek forces due to the Olympic festival. 
All the Onodas had to do was hold and wait and to be re reinforced. Hardly the thinking of a man on a suicide mission. There's another possible reason the Spartans sent so few men. Herodotus tells the story of a council of war uh, called as the Persians appeared and set up camp outside Thermopylae's uh, western gate. Herodotus makes no mention of the Spartans, but the other Peloponnesians argue loudly for the abandoning of Thermopylae and heading back to the Isthmus of Corinth, another choke point that would be just north of the Peloponnesian lands. In other words, the Peloponnesians didn't want to waste their lives protecting territory they didn't live on. Obviously, the Phocians and Locrians who lived right up on top of Thermopylae argued against this, and, and in the end, Leonidas elected to hold position. Whether or not he did this gladly, we can't know, but it's certainly understandable that the ephors back in Sparta were not too happy about sending any more troops no, north to defend territory that wasn't their own. Uh, Herodotus uh, does add that Leonidas sent for help, though from whom he does not say. So again, this is not the action of a man on a suicide mission. There is another factor in the Spartans' thinking, I think. Their age-old enemy of, was Argos. And Argos was right on top of them and squarely in the Persian camp. If they marched north with their whole army, what was to stop the Argives from marching on an undefended Sparta? Or, of course, the, the real Achilles heel, what would stop them from raising the Helots to revolt? At the same time, the Hellenic League sent a naval force of 271 ships, almost 50% of them Athenian, the Spartans contributed only 10, to hold the naval choke point at Artemisium, roughly 40 miles to the northeast. This choke point was chosen instead of one much closer to Thermopylae, likely for two reasons. First, the Greeks needed to prevent the Persians from sailing wherever they pleased. In fact, Herodotus tells us that Demaratus even suggested that the Persian fleet raid the Lyconian coast in an effort to force the Spartans to return to the Peloponnesus and abandon any efforts to fight further north. But this wise plan was rejected. The other reason was that Artemisium protected the north shore of Euboea, an important island. Without this defense, the Persians could easily have landed on it, sacked Eretria for a second time, and simply rode across the channel to march into Attica. Positioning the fleet at Artemisium was the smart play, therefore, and the far more critical part of the battle. The Persian land army would be helpless without the logistical support of the nearby fleet, and the coastal route theoretically gave large numbers of Persian troops quick access to critical landing points, as the Persian effort to get around the Athenian army at Marathon illustrates. Even the Peloponnesians who preferred fighting at the Isthmus of Corinth wouldn't do much good if the Persians could simply bypass it through the gulfs bordering it both north and south. If they were going to stop the Persians, the Hellenic League undoubtedly knew they had to stop them at sea. And so it was that the Persian army arrived at Thermopylae on the same day that the fleet anchored off the coast of Magnesia, just north of the Greek island of Euboea, home of the city-state of Eretria that was sacked during the last Persian invasion. Again, we're not sure of the numbers, but no doubt Xerxes was hopeful that the incredible size of the force that he had assembled, speaking a huge array of languages, armed and armored in a wide range of local fashions, would send the Greeks running. The way Herodotus tells us, the Spartans couldn't have cared less. A Persian scout saw them exercising nude out of their, uh, out before the Phocian wall and combing their long hair. The story may or may not be true, but I don't doubt the sentiment. Far from being a suicide mission, Leonidas would probably have been confident that he had a sufficient force to hold the pass indefinitely. That he was outnumbered was mostly irrelevant due to the excellent terrain and the fact that he had enough troops to rotate out the wounded or fatigued with plenty to take their place. The Persians had the option of outflanking the Spartans through a pass, a path that was called the Anopean Path or the Anopea Path. This went around the steepest parts of Kalidromos, emptying out be behind the Spartan lines. Leonidas would have known that Xerxes was no fool and that the Persians had one of the most sophisticated intelligence networks in the ancient world. 
Long before the main body of Xerxes' army arrived, he would have sent out scouts to reconnoiter the land and would have uh, would have had forward observers and intelligence agents interviewing locals and surveying the terrain. The Persians would absolutely have known about the path long before the first of their vanguard even arrived outside the East Gate. It baffles me, therefore, how many modern scholars just dismiss this fact. Nearly every book and article on the Battle of Thermopylae takes Herodotus' story at face value, that Xerxes, master of the greatest and most sophisticated military machine of the classical period, with all of the intelligence apparatus that entails, would simply fail to perform basic reconnaissance. In the end, it is left to the traitor Ephialtes, a local Greek who decided to betray the Spartans and guide the Persians along the path that they otherwise would have missed. If you've seen that movie, The 300, he is depicted as a physically deformed Spartan, too weak and misshapen to stand in the phalanx, and thus denied his birthright to fight and die with his brethren. It is this rejection in the movie by his own countrymen that drives him into Xerxes' tent to betray his people. But this is nonsense. At the very least, Ephialtes was not Spartan. He very likely didn't exist at all, and the story of the Persians needing a traitor to guide uh, them is papered over for dramatic effect and uh, as an othering device to paint the Persians as fools. Far more likely is, is the fact that the Persians recruited many local guides in the area long before they arrived at Thermopylae, and these local guides provided them with detailed accounts of the, all the terrain and possible routes through and around the pass, and that this body of local guides became the legendary Ephialtes in Herodotus' narrative. But I should hasten to add that because of this infamy that this perhaps real, perhaps not real character of Ephialtes plays in Herodotus' account, that he was the person who betrayed his fellow Greeks. His name has filtered over into the modern Greek language after all of these thousands of years with, uh, to mean the, the word nightmare. Ephialtes is the modern Greek word for nightmare, and it comes from this, this um, putative uh, action of betrayal. Let us consider Thermopylae from the revolutionary perspective of what if we didn't assume the Persians were fools? It seems like an obvious starting point, but it's one that modern scholars have frankly ignored in nearly all writing about Thermopylae, and the result of taking this approach changes everything, as, as we'll see. I, if we, in the kind of narrative that I'm going to lay out for you right now, neither uh, Either there was no Ephialtes, or he was merely one of a huge network of scouts that helped reconnoiter Thermopylae and reported back to the Persian command. Xerxes' local scouts had reported the Anopia path to him, and he was thinking of how to exploit that as his army filed in. The Spartan king Leonidas, also not stupid, knew that Xerxes would do this, but he wasn't worried. Again, he had ample troops, and therefore he deployed the thousand Phocians as Herodotus tells us, a sizable force and possibly under the command of a Spartan peer, acting as a Xenagos officer over the troops. The Phocians were fighting to protect their... He ordered those 1,000 Phocians to guard the uh, the Anopia Pass, the, the, the pathway that would ultimately... Um, the Persians would come through. The Phocians were fighting to protect their home territory. They were well commanded. And they were more than enough to hold the path long enough to be reinforced if it came down to a tough fight. Leonidas would have been informed by the experience at Marathon and was probably confident that a single Greek hoplite was the match of many Persians. Leonidas and his Spartans, seeing the Persians arrive, likely weren't naked and hair combing for long, <laughs> but quickly moved to join the army, armored up, and took up their positions behind the rebuilt Phocian wall. The two armies held position there, Xerxes resting his troops for their, from their long march and probably giving the trailing elements of his enormous army time to catch up, and Leonidas refusing to abandon his perfect defensive position. They all, uh, this weight consumed the first day. On land, the second day mirrored the first. 
the Persians and the Greeks held position watching one another. But out at sea, things went sideways for Persia. A horrific storm struck the Persian fleet off of Magnesia, and the huge armada found an adequate safe harbor to put the ships in. Herodotus describes the seas as boiling, and triremes, at least, uh, are notoriously unseaworthy. So uh, there are coastal ships meant to be agile in calm waters for ramming and so on. Um, they're not meant to stand up far from shore and to weather a storm. So long, narrow, and with shallow drafts, they roll over easily. A bad storm could make short work of an ancient fleet. And that is precisely what happened uh, on the second day uh, at Thermopylae. We don't know the exact number of ships lost, but Herodotus says it was around 400, or a third of the massive flotilla that had mustered to invade. This still outnumbered the Greeks' holding force, roughly three to one. But watching the broken timbers and dead bodies borne out on the current had to give the superstitious Greeks a desperately needed shot in the arm. While Leonidas and his Greeks would not have seen the wreckage from their vantage on the pass of Thermopylae, they probably would have noticed the weather and certainly would have heard about the impact. The two positions of Thermopylae and Artemisium were chosen partly because they were easily linked and communications by boat, foot, and horseback, uh, or all three easily between them would have traveled. For the third and fourth days, both armies and fleets stayed in place. The Greeks had no reason to move. Their plan was working perfectly. They were forcing the Persians to hold position, letting time and the empty bellies of hundreds of thousands of men and animals do their slow, insidious work. Herodotus tells us the reason for the Persian delay was the expectation that the Greeks would run. But this flies in the face of uh, just common sense. Xerxes wasn't stupid, nor was his staff. They knew the Greek numbers and their supply. They knew they occupied nearly perfect defensive terrain. They would have no doubt that the Greeks weren't going anywhere. For the Persians, this period was probably a flurry of reconnaissance activity on land, as well as laying in stores and coordinating with the fleet, who were very likely engaged in the arduous uh, task of recovering from the storm, you know, searching frantically for survivors, salvaging the wrecks and reckoning the damage and all that sort of thing. Well, on the fifth day, Xerxes evidently felt his position was sufficiently consolidated and the fleet had sent word that whatever could be done to salvage the disaster of the storm had been done, and therefore it was time to start the attack. Xerxes sent Median and Sicyon infantry into the pass to assault the Greek position. Both the Medes and Kissians were ancient Iranian peoples. The Medes were the dominant force in the region before the Persians challenged their power and eventually subjugated them. In fact, most Greeks, as I mentioned before, still referred to the Persians simply as Medes, though they were a distinct people. These would have been strong troops representing the trusted core of Xerxes' army. To hear Herodotus tell it, these men simply launched themselves at the entrenched Greek position and battered themselves against it to no effect, being spitted like pigs at a barbecue and dying in heaps. But this, again, kind of violates just common sense, and, and it presumes that the Persians were fools, and they weren't. Uh, and we can, I think, rightfully say that they would have done this, no such thing. What is far more likely is that they advanced to bow range, set up a wall of those sparra, that is, those shields, and then rained arrows on the Greek position from far away. The Greeks already covered head to toe in bronze and protected to their front by the, the thick stone of the repaired Phocian wall, raised their shields to form a roof of bronze-faced wood. The Persians had plenty of arrows, and they would have kept up the shower for hours, seeking unprotected angles or waiting for the Greek troops to get tired, but the pass was so narrow that only a few Greeks could stand in the phalanx at a time, and with 6,000 on hand, remember the thousand Phocians had been sent off to hold the Anopian path, it was easy to rotate in fresh troops as soon as someone's arm got tired to keep his shield up. <laughs> After a while, the Median and Kissian officers would have realized that the archery wasn't going to work. 
They also needed to engage the Greek troops proactively to exhaust and wound them because of the two-pronged plan that Xerxes was hatching. The first prong of it was that the Persians planned to flank the Greek position through the Anopian path. Xerxes or his staff knew that this route was strongly held by a thousand Phocian troops. His intelligence network would have informed him that the Phocians were fighting close to home and would be fierce opponents, but this was no problem. Xerxes detailed his palace troops, the immortals, the Afanatoi, uh, so named because their numbers were never allowed to dip below 10,000. Um, these would have been ethnic Persians, Medes, Elamites of aristocratic stock, trained to peak performance and superior to the troops of the Persian satraps who served under the Persian king. The Afanatoi, the immortals, would have been armed with spears and bows, but probably unarmored, their heads covered only by the tiara. Some may have had bronze helmets, but these were unlikely to have been as complete as the Corinthian pattern many of the Greeks would have worn. Some may have worn body armor made from leather or linen, possibly metal scales. Separate from this core was a hyper elite of a thousand apple bearers, so named because their spears were counterbalanced by, with golden apples at their butt end. Herodotus calls these 1,000 quote, the noblest and bravest of the Persians, end quote. And they appear to have served the same role as the uh, Spartan Hippes, acting as personal guards to the king. Some scholars lump the apple bearers in with the immortals, and when Herodotus relates that all 10,000 immortals were to be sent down the path, he makes it sound as though the apple bearers were among them, but that's not actually correct. The apple bearers would have never left the king. They were kind of like personal bodyguards. And so I think that it's safer to guess that the immortals alone were detailed for the march under the command of the Persian nobleman Hydarnes II, whose father and namesake had helped bring Darius I to power. But this flank now mar march, th this, I'm sorry, this flank march planned for the following day was just half of the Persian plan. I mentioned before that Xerxes was hatching a two-pronged plan. The other half comes from the sea. The Athenian fleet was stationed at the northeastern tip of the island of Euboea. A fleet circumnavigating Euboea would be completely obscured from the Greeks' view. If they moved quickly and at night, they could sail up the western side of the island and arrive right behind the Greek navy. This, of course, was exactly what the Persians planned to do, and every modern account of the battle I've read accepts this. But there's one thing almost no modern accounts consider. The same route would take the Persian fleet directly behind the Greek land position at Thermopylae, where a flanking force could easily be disembarked behind the East Gate, you see. This force then could easily link up with the immortals once they broke through the Phocian defense and trap the Greeks in a pincer maneuver. At that point, the Persian fleet could sail off and create the same pincer movement at sea, trapping the Greek fleet at Artemisium. Herodotus says that this fleet's role was simply to prevent the escape of the Greek fleet, but this does not make sense. Having a fleet in their enemy's rear would have presented too good of an opportunity to put the Greeks in a pincer maneuver, uh, and, and that possibility cannot be ignored. This double pincer plan, if my speculation about it is correct, would have been very smart and perfectly suited to the terrain, and it would have made the best use of the Persian advantage in numbers and their more lightly armored infantry's greater mobility. In short, it was the smart move, and the Persians were very smart. There's no doubt about it. But for this plan to succeed, the Greeks' attention had to be kept facing forward. <coughs> Leonidas's men at Thermopylae needed to be hyper-focused to the west. He knew the Persians would try the Anopia path, and, and was, he was counting on the Phocians to hold them. But he didn't know that a naval force would be disembarking marines to his rear, and that had to be kept from him until the time was right. Likewise, the Greek fleet had to be kept at Artemisian, looking f toward the main body of the Persian fleet, and ignorant of the detachment of 200 Persian ships moving around the east side uh, uh, of first Schiathos and then Euboea. Uh, rounding the island to head up the Euripus Channel, bottling the Greek ships inside. This view much better explains what happened next 
than the traditional story. That is, the traditional story is that the Medes and Christians threw themselves recklessly against the Greek phalanx, dying in huge numbers for no good reason. Again, this makes sense only if we view the Persians as a wild, untrained rabble rather than the army of one of the most advanced civilizations of the time. Uh, but I do not doubt that with their inferior weapons and armor, the Persians did get the worst of the close combat once they came uh, came up close, One that is once they gave up archery and they charged. Though this is disputed, I believe the Persians' spears were shorter than the Greeks and as I said before, that they lacked butt spikes, which meant that they would have been rendered useless if they broke. Their light axes would have had some impact, but they would have had to have gotten very, very close to use them, and the Greeks were uh, sure not to cooperate. Uh, their cane and rawhide shields were sturdy enough to fend off arrows like their own, but they would easily be punched through by a hoplite spear or split by a chop from a heavy Greek Xithos, uh, kind of, a, you know, a sword. We must also give credit to the Spartans here. These were not the same men who had formed the war band in Messenia, cheering while their king broke ranks to engage in heroic combat in front of the line. The 300 Spartans at Thermopylae knew that their position would stand or fall based on the cohesion of their phalanx. There could be no gaps in the line that the Persians uh, could widen to create a fatal breach. Their Boeotian, Locrian, and Arcadian comrades might be only part-time warriors, but they were clearly at the top of their game. They would have been kicking legs, shoving shoulders, bellowing at the men around them to hold the line. These Spartans would have keenly felt the pressure of their reputation. They knew the other Greeks were looking at them to lead, that if their lead faltered, the battle would be lost. And yet we must also remember that the Persians that they, the, the Persians they faced were no rabble. The Persians were highly trained too. They were brave, and they would have made the best of a bad situation, seizing Greek spears and trying to rip them from their wielder's grasp. One man hooking the top of a Greek shield with his axe spike, yanking it down to expose the holder to a thrust from his comrade's spear. They fought in earnest, likely unaware of the larger plan, believing that it was their job to break the Greek line and clear the pass. But their commanders, and certainly Xerxes, knew better. This was a probe, an attack intended to take their measure and sound out their weaknesses, to weaken the enemy with wounds and fatigue. But above all this, it was an attack planned to grab the Greeks' attention and focus it firmly to the west, away from the Anopean path and the naval flanking force that would be sailing around Euboea to attack them from behind. However, the Greeks could not have known this. As far as Leonidas was concerned, he had no word from the Phocian position that the Anopean path had been taken by the enemy. The Medes and Kissians were trying to break through here and now, and he and his men fought ferociously to make sure that they failed. When at long last the horn sounded the recall and the Medes and Kissians withdrew, the hoplites would have thrust their spears into the earth to stand upright on their butt spikes, and leaned on them, panting, helmets propped on their backs, uh, the backs of their heads, that is, shields grounded, resting against their legs. In this posture, they could ease their tired muscles, but still be ready to snatch their arms back up in an instant. And they didn't have long. In fact, even now, the Persian commanders were mustering the immortals. The same men who were assigned to march the Anopean path were turning out into ranks to make a second attack on the Greek position. Leonidas and his men would well know the reputation of this corps and would have been able to identify them by their dress. The committing of the immortals surely signaled that Xerxes intended to break through from the west. Leonidas' eyes were fixed firmly on his enemy and away from the unprotected shore of the Malian Gulf to his rear. He might have remained ignorant if not for a deserter from the Persian fleet a salvage diver named Scylius. Herodotus identifies this man as a Thessalian, so he was likely one of the Greeks who submitted to the Persians either during the early campaigns around Marathon or in the rush to seek Persian favor once the Hellenic League abandoned Tempe. As a diver, he could presumably swim hidden under the water for long periods of time and use this to make good his escape. 
Herodotus tells uh, uh, the reader, uh, turns to the reader and admits that he doubts Scylius could have swam that far and that he came by boat. However, he arrived, Scylius surfaced among the Greek ships, got himself hauled aboard a trireme and promptly gave his report that the Persians were sending a fleet around Euboea to attack the Greeks from behind. The Greek fleet took counsel from this decision and determined it would launch after dark and head back down the channel, intercepting the flanking fleet and catching it by surprise. In the meantime, however, the Greeks decided to try themselves again uh, against the main Persian fleet before them. Herodotus tells us this was motivated by a desire to see how the Persians fought at sea. But again, that makes little sense and violates this basic principle of common sense, which holds that just as true for the Greeks as it would for the Persians, that they're both competent soldiers. Far more realistically, therefore, uh, is the idea that the Greeks, like the Persians, were seeking to misdirect and make sure that the Persians didn't suspect they were aware of the flanking force by instigating a battle. Herodotus tells us that the Persians were taken completely by surprise, seeing the heavily outnumbered Greeks rowing to the attack. They scrambled to launch from the beach at Aphetai, just opposite the Greek position off Artemisium. Here we have to pause to describe the ancient naval maneuver known as the uh, Diekplus, which I, I talked about before. I mistakenly said the Periplus, but it's the Diekplus, actually. Uh, this literally means the rowing through and past, and it's a, it's a fancy word to describe a simple tactic. When presented with enough space between two enemy triremes, or if one's line of ships was longer than the enemy's, you simply rode past your sh uh, the, the ship's enemy, uh, your enemy, keeping as close as possible. Scholars debate whether part of this maneuver involved shipping your oars uh, at, at the last possible minute so that your hull sheared off the enemy's oars, sparing your own, or if it was simply just to kind of go past them. But at any rate, as soon as your bow passed the enemy's stern, you cut hard to port or starboard, depending on which side you passed, and then rammed the enemy in the quarter or stern. The Greeks were horrifically outnumbered in this engagement, which meant they would intensely they, they would be intensely vulnerable to this sort of tactic. Themistocles, the Athenian commander responsible for the existence of Athens's navy, and certainly for its naval strategy, despite Sparta's overall command, ordered the ships to form into a circle uh, uh, sterns in, rams pointing out. Some scholars dispute that this would be possible with 271 ships, and I agree with them. It is far more likely that they formed a kind of half moon line bowing out toward the enemy. Um, this would still make the Diaclus impossible and accommodate as many ships as, as they had. Herodotus doesn't give many details about the battle that followed, but the Greeks clearly got the better of it, capturing 30 enemy ships. Ramming prow to prow was a risky proposition for both ships, which meant that if the Persians wanted to come to grips with the Greeks, they would have to board, and then all of the close combat advantages of the hoplite marines would come into play. Some scholars dispute this, saying the Greek marines would have been armed more lightly than their land-based colleagues. However, Greek ships were slower and bulkier uh, than their Persian counterparts and also likely carried greater numbers of marines, even if they weren't armed and armored as heavily as hoplites. Meanwhile, back on land, the immortals were essentially repeating the Medes and Kistians' performance from earlier in the day. Here, if we believe Herodotus, the Spartans executed a brilliant maneuver that punished the elite unit severely. The immortals, likely having learned from the poor close combat performance of the Medes and Kissians, stood off and tried their luck with arrows. Either impatient or worried that some of the shots were beginning to tell, uh, Leonidas ordered his troops to make a feigned retreat. Remember that whatever the commanders knew of the Persian flanking strategy, the rank and file, even of a palace unit, did not. As far as they were concerned, the Greeks were finished. They returned their bows to their cases, hefted their spears, and charged. Herodotus implies that this charge was mad and disorganized. 
But again, this does not seem to jive with the highly disciplined nature of the immortal core. They were highly trained troops. If the feigned retreat story is true, then I would suspect the immortals did indeed pursue, but did so in an ordered fashion. The result, of course, was the same. When they reached the Greek position, the Greeks turned, reformed, and engaged. Too close to use their bows, the Persians were forced to fight in the Greeks' preferred style of close combat. Whatever their elite status, the immortals' equipment was still no match for the Greeks, who made short work of them. Some scholars argue that only a disciplined force such as the Spartans could pull off such a complex maneuver, but I disagree. I, uh, this is the sort of thing that I think uh, in any amount of training that um, the Greek hoplite phalanxes would have received, they could learn about how to do this sort of thing. Um, be that as it may, nightfall ultimately single, signaled the end of the fighting on both land and sea, but there were still Persian losses to come. Once again, a terrible storm blew up, catching the Persian flanking fleet off Euboea's unprotected eastern shore, utterly wiping them out. The coastline there is rocky and inhospitable, offering no sandy shoreline to beach ships. The Persians had no choice but to try to ride out the weather or make their way through it, and not a single ship survived. The Greek fleet would have sent word to Leonidas as soon as Scylius spilled the beans about the Persian plan, but we don't know if that runner would have arrived yet, as lookouts stationed on Euboea reported the wreckage of the Persian flanking fleet, another one would have been sent with a follow-up message to the tune of, uh, remember that fleet we were warning about? Well, no sweat, uh, the storm took care of it. Well, as the sun arose on the sixth day of these two battles, these twin battles, things were looking good for the Greeks. They had held position on both land and sea, and Xerxes' first major maneuver had failed utterly. The sixth day proceeded exactly as the fifth. Xerxes, is funnel, Xerxes funneled infantry into the pass to probe the Greek front, and they were repulsed with reportedly heavy losses. Herodotus is sh short on details for this day's land fighting, save pointing out the rotation and resting of the Greek troops and noting that all the contingents, not just the Spartans, got a turn standing and fighting. As I mentioned earlier, while Herodotus describes this only on the second day, uh, I believe this was the plan of action throughout all of the fighting. At sea, things went even better for the Greeks. Reinforcements arrived from Athens in the shape of 53 ships, presumably with stores of food and full crews. With the Persian fleet already down by hundreds of ships, this modest boost to the Greek naval ranks went a long way toward evening the odds. More importantly, was the boost to morale provided by this development, coupled with the sight of the wreckage and drowned corpses of the Persian flanking fleet. Herodotus confirms that the Greeks saw the, the gods favoring them and mustered the courage to try another attack. It was again successful, but we have no details other than that it was carried out at the same time of day and that they attacked the Cilician squadron. Cilicia is a coastal region of the Persian Empire, uh, kind of in the southeast central portion of Turkey. Uh, and so... Uh, the Greeks sank this contingent, the Cilician squadron, uh, 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 and then returned to their own position at Artemision before nightfall. But darkness brought the execution of the second prong of Xerxes's flanking maneuver. Presumably the damaged immortals replenished their ranks, the most promising Persian warriors being promoted to take up new positions to that, uh, so that the fixed number never fell below 10,000. Otherwise, it was a reduced force that set out on the An Anopaya path, navigating by moonlight. If we assume horrific casualties from the previous day's fighting, say 20%, then you would still have more than 7,000 Persians on the march to confront 1,000 Phocians. Here, Herodotus' story becomes almost impossible to accept. According to him, the immortals caught the Phocians essentially napping. He describes them scrambling for their weapons and armor, despite the huge number of Persian troops broadcasting their approach through the dead leaves crunching under 7,000 pairs of feet. 
The Phocians had deployed no scouts, set up no watches, deployed no pickets, a massive violation of uh, common sense, really, that uh, I find very hard to believe. What Herodotus describes next is actually even more unbelievable, though. Hydarnes was caught just as unawares as the Phocians were. Expecting the pass to be unguarded and terrified that he might be facing more Spartans, he reportedly asked his guide, that Ephialtes fellow, to identify the enemy. Ephialtes replied that they were Phocians, which calmed Hydarnes enough to sound the attack. This could not be the case. First of all, it again violates common sense by leaning entirely on the premise that Hydarnes and indeed the entire Persian high command were fools. The far more likely scenario is that Hydarnes knew full well the path was guarded and by whom it was guarded and how many they were. As I mentioned before, his troops were likely guided along the Anopaya path by several locals hired for the purpose whom Herodotus kind of, we might speculate, mashes together into the character of Ephialtes. But even if Hydarnes had found himself facing 1,000 Spartans, he would have done so at the head of seven times their number, at least, of his own troops, and this time not at a choke point, uh, just as wide as a wagon's breath, um, and protected by a stone wall. He would have been confident in his advantage and pressed the attack and he would have been right to do so. Uh, if one visits the Anopaya Path today, beginning at the tiny Greek village of Vardates and heading east around Kalidromos, it isn't known exactly where the Phocians held their position blocking the path, but it was almost certainly east of the modern mountain village of Eleftokori, where the ground widens into a broad and relatively flat mountain plain. And when one hikes it nowadays, the ground is broad and flat enough to soak up the rain that uh, steadily falls sometimes for several days at a time, turning it into a treacherous kind of muddy bog. One thing Herodotus does get right is that Hydarnes orders his troops to stand off and rains arrows down on the enemy. But the rest, I think he just, make, uh, he just makes up. It makes no sense at all. Herodotus tells us that the Phocians, feeling that all was lost, withdrew to the highest point on the battlefield, abandoned their blocking position on the path, and prepared to hold out to the last man. The immortals, under orders to flank the Greek position in the pass below, simply shrugged and bypassed the Phocians, marching on to take up position behind Leonidas' troops. This again doesn't seem to be logical, because it is spectacularly stupid, really. If what Herodotus says is true, then the Persian palace troops simply marched along, leaving 1,000 enemy troops in their rear, which beggars believe. And even more unbelievably, the Phocians were on their home turf, and they knew the ground intimately. The Persians knew they would be descending towards Leonidas's position, which meant that not only would they be leaving the Phocians behind them, they would be ceding them the high ground, which is uh, an unforgivable tactical error. Herodotus' story, therefore, makes sense only if the Persians were complete fools, and as I've kept on, kept on repeating, they obviously were not. So what I think actually happened, and to be fair, I cannot prove this, so what I, the following is going to be speculation, but it seems to me that the Phocians probably deployed to hold the path and fighting on their home territory, put their shields up, and whether the storm of arrows, as their comrades had in the past below, the immortals under pressure to clear the path and move into position behind Leonidas, gave up on archery and closed for shock and awe, that is, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And as we've already seen, their inferior weapons and armor put them at an extreme disadvantage. But on the comparatively open terrain of the Anopaya path, they were able to spread out and to use their greater numbers to their advantage. The Phocian hoplites were occupied fighting two or three Persians in front of them, defenseless against the immortals who uh, attacked them from behind them, um, thrusting their daggers into the gaps between corslet and helmet, severing spines or hamstrings the Greeks with sharp blows from their light axes. The Phocians would have known that losing here meant their farms and homes would be looted and burned, their treasure taken for prizes, 
their wives and children slaughtered or sold into slavery. They would have fought like men possessed, making the immortals pay dearly for every inch of ground. But in the end, the Persian numbers would have simply overwhelmed them. Perhaps they were wiped out to the last man. Perhaps Hydarne is paused for a moment, panting, surveying the heap of corpses before him, his own mingled with the Greeks, and admire the bravery of the Phocians, and maybe even the Spartans who led them. We know the Persians honored the brave among their enemies from previous encounters. Descri this is described by Herodotus, uh, saying that they even spared the lives of captives who had fought well against them. But however bravely the Phocians had fought, in the end they did lose, and Hydarnes led his immortals down from the heights and into the Greek backfield. Persian deserters had already brought word to Leonidas of the night march, and the Phocian scouts had been streaming in with the, the dawn to give him the news of the fight on the path and its outcome. As the sun rose, Leonidas' scouts would have confirmed the reports, seeing the 7,000 or so immortals, minus the casualties that uh, that were taken in the fight of the path, which I assume were light, and, and, see, and he would have seen them coming down. Many scholars ask why. If Leonidas knew he would be flanked by the Anopaya path, he sent only 1,000 Phocians to guard it. I would argue that the Spartans had the example of Marathon, where Greek hoplites had won out against a vastly larger number of Persians. Uh, as an abject lesson, that 1,000 hoplites would be more than enough to hold the position, even against a numerically superior foe. Now, at this point, the story again takes yet another unbelievable turn. If we accept Herodotus's narrative, then Leonidas held a council of war and concluded that they were about to be overrun. According to Herodotus, opinions were sharply divided, with many of the Greeks being in favor of abandoning the position before they were cut off by the immortals descending from the heights. And this makes good sense. The Peloponnesian allies were already on record as wanting to defend from the Isthmus uh, of, of Corinth. Why should they die so far north? The Locrians, hearing, the Phocian, uh, hearing that the Phocians had been annihilated, may well have been desperate to get back to their own families to evacuate them or to mount a defense closer to home. Herodotus then has Leonidas dismiss the majority of the army, sending the men home because he was not confident they were committed to the fight. This doesn't make sense to me. The Greek goal was to delay the Persians as long as possible, and with 6,000 Greeks, minus the Phocians and whatever other casualties had been taken so far, which I think were light up to this point, they could still defend the ground in two directions, especially when you consider that the force outflanking them was comparatively small. Therefore, I believe Leonidas argued to hold the position, and he faced a mutiny in his forces. Uh, this had happened to Cleomenes, uh, the Spartan general and Spartan king, uh, outside of Athens in the year 506. The Peloponnesian allies defied Leonidas's orders to hold position, shouldered their arms, and marched home, I think, leaving the, the, the remaining Spartans, and along with 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans, to finish the fight. It isn't clear how much time passed between their departure and the immortals arriving um, and therefore cutting out the road off that, that was to lead home. But perhaps the dust kicked up by their exit mingled with that swirling from the immortals' approach as they deployed in ranks to block the remaining Greeks' retreat. Some scholars argue that Leonidas' decision to remain, along with the Thespians and Thebans, was a selfless sacrifice, a move to delay the Persian cavalry who would surely have ridden down the rest of the retreating Greeks if they did not have someone to occupy them for the time being. But I doubt this is true. Leonidas most likely cursed the departing Greeks for, as being cowards and would have been more than happy to see them run down by a Persian horseman if his duty weren't to prevent any Persians from passing his position. Whatever the case of that may be, though, those men did leave, and they left only the 300 or so Spartans, along with those 700 Thespians and 400 Thebans. And so it was that on the seventh day, as the seventh day dawned, with the Greeks on land reduced to a tiny fraction, and their, uh, their, a tiny fraction of their already small force, uh, the last day of the battle now began. We have to remember that the Spartans were not just the 300, they were there were originally something like 1,000 
and that's not counting uh, that each of the homoioi would have had at least one helot attendant with uh, with each one of them, those men very likely being fighters alongside of them. So this would put the Spartan figures at more like 1,300, minus some casualties by this point. And if we add in the Thespians and the Thebans, we have something maybe of a force of 2,000. Still more than enough to hold the pass, really. However, Leonidas made a surprising decision, if Herodotus again is to be believed. He marched the full force into the wider portion of the pass, abandoning the Phocian Wall, and took the fight to the Persians. Herodotus seems to be implying that Leonidas was guided by the oracle and, and wanted to fulfill the terms of his suicide mission, seeking to do as much damage to the Persians as he could and selling his life dearly. But again, I have to admit I don't think this is the case. What really happened? Well, with his force greatly reduced, multiple explanations are possible. Firstly, that Herodotus' story is false and Leonidas did, did not advance, that is a possibility. Maybe Herodotus gets this wrong. Uh, he might have, for all we know, withdrew to a, loca to a further location in. Uh, there's a small hill of Colonus right near there. Um, we do have some evidence that this is the location, actually, of the final Spartan defeat, because many arrowheads, Persian arrowheads, uh, which are currently on display at the Archaeological Museum at Athens, were supposedly excavated from the, this exact site. Um, some archaeologists dispute that, but that is what they purport to be. Another possibility is that Leonidas was seeking to recreate the conditions of Marathon, looking either to break through the Persian army or else to rout it with a charge. And this theory makes more sense if we believe the Persian force was smaller than is commonly believed. There's an interesting version of the story told by that historian Diodorus Siculus, whom I mentioned earlier, where he talks about a night attack where Leonidas led the remaining Greeks in an effort to storm Xerxes' camp and kill the great king himself. This is completely at odds with Herodotus's narrative, and, um, uh, and therefore most modern historians dismiss it. But I wonder if Diodorus is misinterpreting, or is at least influenced by an earlier lost source that indicated that Leonidas's decision to move out from the Phocian Wall was motivated by a last-ditch attempt to break out and perhaps even reach Xerxes's camp in the hopes that by cutting off the snake's head, as it were, the body would slither away. Another possibility is that Leonidas was attempting to consolidate his position, trying to drive the Persians back so he could hold the narrower west gate and then defend the Phocian Wall in the other direction against the immortals, now attacking him from the east. My best guess, and really nobody, no historian can make more than that, really, uh, given the availability of the sources, my best guess is that Leonidas did not have a good count on the number of troops massing to his rear beyond the east gate. No doubt the panicked Phocian runners who brought the news of the defeat on the uh, Anopaya path inflated the numbers in the telling. Leonidas would have known only that a great number of Xerxes's very best troops had cut off the passage behind him. With most of his army melted away, therefore, he knew that his ability to hold the pass was fatally compromised. He had enough men to man the gaps both east and west, but exhaustion and wounds would have soon taken their toll, and he was no longer uh, with the reserves to keep rotating fresh troops in. It is therefore possible that the immortals descended from the heights inside the east gate, which meant Leonidas's ability to close off that choke point was lost. Because this was most decidedly not a suicide mission, as I've tried to make the case, Leonidas then had to figure out what to do next, a plan that would damage the enemy and keep his own people alive. Well, Given what he knew, the Persian army in front of him, beyond the West Gate, and what he didn't know, how many immortals behind, were behind him, he chose the one he knew. And the uh, salpinges, that is the long trumpets used by the ancient Greeks, sounded the advance into the teeth of the enemy. His ultimate motive, whether to drive the Persians back and secure the West Gate to break out or to kill Xerxes, will have to remain a mystery. I do imagine, though, that the Persians would have had much of the same reaction as they witnessed the large Greek charge at Marathon. 
marathon. That is jaw-dropping disbelief that anyone would be so uh, so impetuous, so mad, really. Even with casualties and the detachment of the immortals, the Persians still outnumbered the Greek force somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 1. The Greeks had been fighting nearly nonstop for three days. Their armor would have been dented and cracked, ragged rents visible in the linen and leather of their cuirasses, strips of bronze peeling back from the notches of their heavy shields. Some of them may even have been wielding their spears with their butt spikes facing out, the heads having snapped off long ago. Others may even have abandoned their spears altogether and advanced with their swords drawn. In fact, Herodotus makes this exact point, that uh, they were reduced to fighting with their sh their swords because um, uh, because their, their spears had been so damaged. The Persians would have heard the Spartan shouts echoing across the distance, calling on the hoplites to dress the line to make sure the shields remain locked, leaving no gaps for Persian arrows to exploit. The Spartan helots would have jogged along the flanks, animal skins or linen wrapped around their left arms. One or two may have scavenged a Persian wicker shield. In their right hands, they would have carried javelins or slings or even heavy rocks. The Persians would have answered, as at Marathon, ordering the sparabara, the shields, to, the shield bearers, to plant their shields, and the archers aiming high and letting their light arrows down to shower the advancing Greeks. If we believe this, that the Spartans were acting as xenagoi, as kind of military advisors to foreign troops, they might have bellowed to their charges, shields up, beware of the arrows, at the run now. The heavy round shields would have come up, the arrows pattering off them harmlessly. Here and there, the small three-edged heads of the arrows, finding purchase to quiver in the thin covering of the bronze. Here and there a hoplite would hiss as a lucky shot grazed his bare thigh or arm. The helots would have not been so lucky, of course, because they did not have shields. They would have dashed into the phalanx, seeking cover behind their better armored masters. And the Spartan poet Tertius actually tells us about them doing exactly this in one of his poems. No doubt more than a few of them would have died screaming, the arrows easily penetrating their thin clothing. And as at Marathon, the Greek line would have raised the peon, that is the hymn to Apollo, that is was sounded when an army charges, and then they would have charged. The Persians might have gotten another volley or two off before the Greeks reached the mass of Sparta and either ripped them aside or blew straight through them. Once again, the Persian inferiority of equipment would tell, and many of them would have died, spitted through by the heavy Greek spears, limbs ripped off by the powerful strokes of those cleaver swords, the kopides. Where they fell, the Greeks would have trampled them, eyes front, but bronze stabbing spears coming down upon them to make sure the wounded did not rise again to trouble them. The Persian line would have recoiled. It may even have bowed. Some of the levy infantry might have dropped their weapons, terrified by the relentlessness of the Greek onslaught, trying to claw their way back through their own troops to reach safety. Leonidas here may even have dared to hope that his plan would work, looking up at Xerxes's palatial command tent or the throne on which the great king watched the battle unfold. He may have believed that they could make it to him and kill the cut to cut the head off the snake, but two thousand men were not seven thousand, and in the wide expanse of the pass, the Persians could bring their numerical superiority to bear. The phalanx, no doubt, was heavily uh, armored, highly effective when its ranks were secure, but that was not possible now and the hoplites on the left and right of the line would have found themselves having to fight in two directions at once. Distracted by the enemy to their front, the enemy to their side would be able to slip behind their guard, burying the spear point in an exposed armpit or neck. Worse, the exertion of the contest would be telling, the few lucky arrows piercing feet or arms making movement slow and painful. The archers, brave enough not to have fled, would be shooting point-blank into the Greeks' faces, 
not bothering to arc their missiles now. Some of these might find the small holes in the Corinthian helmets, the soft eyes open wide behind them. A shudder might have run through the phalanx as the Greek charge slowed. The Persians would have seen this, taken heart, and surged forward. And then amidst all of this melee, Leonidas fell. Herodotus gives no details surrounding the king's death, only that, quote, he proved himself extremely valiant, end quote. The fact that the Persians were even able to reach Leonidas shows how badly mauled the phalanx must have been at this point. As the king, he would have been surrounded by his hippes, the youngest and best of the Spartans sent out on the expedition. Furthermore, the, the other Greeks would have known how important the king's life was to the morale of the remaining force, and would have fought very ferociously to defend him. Perhaps Leonidas channeled Theopompus, the old Spartan king, for a moment, driving forward to take the fight to the enemy. Perhaps Xerxes's troops punched through his bodyguard and took the fight to the king themselves. The enormous respect the king commanded is shown by the terrific effort the Greeks made to recover his body. It was something similar only to what one reads about in the Iliad, where there was a kind of heroic fight over the corpse of a slain hero. Four times they threw the enemy back in their desperate attempt to drag Leonidas's bloody corpse into their own phalanx. Herodotus tells us the Persians lost their own notables in this meat grinder, including at least two brothers of Xerxes. At last, the rear guard uh, or the helot lookouts would have raised the call. The immortals were streaming in through the east gate. If the Greeks remained where they were, they would be crushed in open ground from both before and behind. They retreated, therefore, fighting the whole way, weapons breaking pieces of armor stripped away as straps snapped or cast off as ragged rips in the bronze turned a helmet into a blade cutting its wearer. Herodotus tells us that now not even swords were, them, were available to them, but they fought with fists and teeth. They wouldn't have bothered with the Phocian Wall now. It would do them no good against the immortals racing down toward them from behind it. Instead, they withdrew over it and up to a small hill, the Colonus Hill, where they rested the king's body in the center and formed a circle around him, splintered shields overlapping as best they could, many armed with little more than the broken nub of a sword blade held by its hilt in the hope the jagged edge would still do some good. They would have watched in grim defiance as the Persians swirled, completely surrounding them, a tiny island of Greeks in the sea of enemies. It was at this point that the surviving Thebans threw down their arms and surrendered. Their home city-state had already submitted to Persia. Perhaps the enemy would view them kindly for that. Well, if that was what they thought, they'd bet wrong. Many of them were shot dead by Persian arrows, even as they advanced with their weapon hands open and empty to show they meant no harm. The rest were taken behind the lines and branded with Xerxes's mark to herald their future as Persian slaves. Herodotus' account of the final moments of the remaining Greeks is graphic. They fought with the stubs of their spears and the jagged hilts of their snap swords, and when these failed, as I said, they fought with fists and teeth. At long last, the Persians judged them so exhausted that they were no longer worth the effort of a close assault. The officers ordered their troops to stand off and shower the Greeks with arrows. With their armor battered and stripped, their heavy shields shattered, the Greeks could do nothing more than throw up their hands against the storm of arrows, javelins, and thrown rocks, all falling like some hideous metal storm, burying them utterly. The final casualty count is not known. Certainly hundreds of the allied Greeks, whom Herodotus does not bother to count by their, uh, to count by their polis, he does tell us that 4,000 Greeks in total died, and he reckons the helots separately, so we can guess that he is referring only to hoplites here. The 298 Spartans, two were sent away, one was a messenger and one with an eye infection so severe he could not fight. Both, later, both survivors would later commit suicide after being shunned by their community for having the temerity to live when their countrymen had died. These... Uh, amounted to just 7% of the total Greek dead, and their loss was just a fraction 
of Sparta's total muster. Thespiae, the city-state of Thespiae, meanwhile, had contributed 18% of the total casualties. Their contribution went nearly completely unnoticed until they finally received a monument on the battlefield at the shockingly late date of 1997 AD. We do have the name of their strategos, a man named Demophilus, but nothing more. Of course, uh, both the 300 Spartans from 1962 and that recent movie, The 300, do give him a cameo, however. This still leaves some 3,000 other allied Greek dead whose contribution was boiled down in that movie, The 300, to a, the throwaway dismissal of brave amateurs, they do their part. And of course, the helots, Let's not forget about them, who would have done their masters cooking and cleaning, who would have bound their wounds, repaired their armor, and passed up spare spears to replace the ones that broke, all before joining the homoioi to fight in the past. They are completely ignored. We cannot say with certainty how many they were. They may have been as few as 300, one for each of the homoioi, or as many as 2,100, seven for each spear. Uh, that was exactly the number that they would have taken at the Battle of Plataea in the following year, which we will talk about later. It is possible that some escaped the battle and their fight. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, and their flight, as with their contributions, was not reported. But it is far more likely that they stood and fought alongside their oppressors, doggedly holding the pass and the tiny hill to their last breath. The Greek defense at Thermopylae had been wiped out to the last man. But the fleet at Artemisium no longer had a reason to hold its position, did it now, that the Persian land army could simply march past it unmolested? So it quit the Cape and withdrew south to Salamis, the island of Salamis. Xerxes's losses had been higher than he would have liked, but the truth was that the great king could easily absorb the casualties and each mouth permanently closed by a Greek spear, was one less that would need water and food. Herodotus reports that Xerxes is, w flew into a rage as Leonidas's defiance, uh, at Leonidas's defiance, ordering his body to be desecrated. The head was severed and fixed to a stake for the edification of those of the army as it passed by. He gives the Persian losses at the absolutely in, insanely inflated figure of 20,000, but accuses Xerxes of burying all but 1,000 immediately to hide the extent of, of the damage. I am more inclined to believe that the 1,000 was closer to the actual extent of the Persian loss, with Herodotus doing what he could to rehabilitate Greek reputation following what could be reckoned only as a devastating defeat. Even with the losses of, to the Persian army, though, the Greek strate strategic objective to delay the Persians long enough to starve their army out had, too, failed utterly. The Achaemenid land army, that is the Persian army, had been delayed for a grand total of three days and could now march unopposed into Greece, straight for the prize that had eluded it ten years before, the towering Acropolis of Athens, just 130 miles to the southeast. That the delay had been so paltry was reinforced by Xerxes' decision to remain in the pass for the following two days, opting to take time to rest and regroup after the taxing fight rather than race onward toward his objective. The Hellenic League must have been horrified. In just three days, their strategy of delay and starvation had completely unraveled. Not only had they lost critical ships and men in the sea fight at Artemisium, but some 4,000 hoplites now lay dead in the pass, and the head of a Spartan king was fixed on a pole. In a brilliant and critical review of that movie, The 300, popular historian Tom Holland theorized that Themistocles, known to be a kind of master spin doctor, immediately set about disseminating the story of a heroic last stand in a desperate effort to shore up Greek morale, which must have been teetering on the brink of collapse. What was a slaughter must now somehow be repackaged and sold as a glorious last stand if the Greeks were to have any hope of staying in the fight. The legendary Spartans hadn't been little more than a speed bump under the wheels of the Persian war machine. No, they had, been obedient, they had obediently stood their post 
as surely as all Spartans must do. Uh, they were commanded by their laws to, uh, to conquer or die. And this foundational myth is made most famous by an epitaph that was written by around the, the turn of the 5th century by the poet Simonides, which has been translated into English time and again, but whose most famous rendering is engraved on a memorial place at the site, and it says, Go, stranger, thou that passest by, and tell the Spartans that we obedient to their orders here do lie. Surely someone was dispatched to tell the Spartans that that was of little concern to Xerxes, who no doubt had his troops strip the enemy dead of their weapons and armor for the king's treasury for reuse among his own troops, or possibly to build a trophy for the benefit of his Greek troops. Remember that Leonidas had famously said when he was approached by the um, Persian envoy to lay down his weapons, he, he famously retorted, Molon Labe, come and take him. Well, at the end, Xerxes, Xerxes did precisely that. He came and took his weapons. And in the wake of the battle, the cities of central Greece submitted to Xerxes wholesale, with the exception of wounded Thespiae, Phocis, and Athens's ally Plataea, whose citizens, having fought at Marathon, probably thought they could expect little mercy. These citizens sheltered in the Peloponnesus, and the Persians put their empty cities to the torch. Athens completely defenseless, was evacuated. The identity of a Greek polis was in its citizens, not its city, per se. So if the people could be saved, then the city could be repopulated when the Persians had moved on. Leonidas's brother, Cleombrotus, oversaw the fortification of the Isthmus of Corinth, no doubt with some degree of relief that if there were another land battle with the Persians, it would be fought there where it should have been in the first place, really, as far as the Peloponnesians were concerned. A few diehards held out on the Athenian Acropolis, older volunteers who trusted to an oracle which told them to put their faith in Athens's wooden wall. Most Athenians, remember, had read this to mean the wooden hulls of the, of the fleet and had evacuated to Salamis under their navy's protection, but there were, were apparently a few hardliners who thought that this meant the wooden defenses built around the Acropolis, and if, uh, if that was what they were thinking, these poor few volunteers on the Acropolis were wiped out in short order, and Xerxes's army uh, put Athens's most sacred places to the torch. Salamis and its shore, some... 20 miles away from the city, and the Acropolis is Athens's highest point. The refugees must have watched in horror as the blaze rose into the night sky. Xerxes's fleet pursued the Greeks to Salamis and engaged them there. The Spartans had little role in the battle. They contributed just 16 ships to the fleet, which was under the command of a Spartan admiral. But brilliant admiralship by Themistocles and the Athenian contingent managed to secure a crushing victory. In fact, the real Spartan contribution was almost to lose the battle before it started, because a panicked council of war was held at the Greek, as the Greek fleet saw the fires of the Athenian Acropolis. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, of the Athenian Acropolis, and received word that the Persians had taken the city. The Peloponnesians, led by the Corinthians, were, of course, in favor of withdrawing the fleet to the Isthmus, probably to make their stand in the open waters of the Saronic Gulf. This was a disastrous strategy, though, since it would, again, allow the Persians the advantage of deploying their superior numbers, um, which were still much greater than the Greek fleet, despite the mauling they had taken both on the way to and at Artemisium. The Spartan admiral, Eurybiades, nominally the commander of the Greek fleet, agreed with this plan and approved it. Themistocles, though, rightly realized that if the fleet withdrew, it would never reach the Isthmus intact. Rather, each contingent would sail away to protect its home waters, and all chance of mustering a fleet big enough to take on Xerxes would evaporate. And even if the fleet somehow managed to hang together, it would be enveloped and annihilated in the open waters off of Corinth. 
Their chance to win was to fight where they were, in, in const constrained straits like those of Artemisian, which alone could give the heavier Greek triremes the advantage. The Corinthian contingent tried to shout Themistocles down, but the Athenians reminded them and all the assembled commanders that Athens had the strongest navy, and should they decide to turn that strength against another Greek city-state, they would be powerless to stop them. The message foreshadowed Athenian naval uh, bully diplomacy, basically, in the years to come. But it also worked for now and allowed Themistocles to continue his appeal unopposed. As a final gut punch, Themistocles threatened Eurybides that if he did not use his power as admiral to order the entire fleet to stand and fight, then the Athenians would evacuate their entire fleet to southern Italy and start a new colony there, leaving the Greek navy so shorthanded that they wouldn't have a hope of defeating Xerxes. The argument worked. The Spartans agreed to hold the line, but only under Themistocles' threat and with the greatest reluctance. This argument would flare up again, and to be fair to Eurybiades and the other Peloponnesians, they were terrified for their families and homes, which were still vulnerable to Xerxes' land army, even now ravaging Attica. If the Greek fleet were defeated at Salamis, they would be unable to assist with the defense against the land army as it marched further south. Themistocles then sent word to Xerxes in either a betrayal, if you believe some scholars, or a brilliant act of deception, if you believe others. Uh, I think he was hedging his bets, personally, trying to make sure that whoever won, he would be in the winner's circle. But at any rate, the plan worked exceedingly well, uh, because what he said, essentially, um, was that... Uh, uh, that he he sent word to the to the Persians that the Greeks were in disarray, which was true. That some were even contemplating um, either, uh, withdrawing altogether and, uh, and and just returning back to their to their homes, which was which was true. Um, but then the lie came. He said that uh, in that because they were planning on on leaving, that Themistocles was willing to hand over and kind of betray the, the Athenian fleet into the hands of the great king, because that's what, that's basically he knew that the, that the jig was up. Um, and so he, uh, he said that it once you, basically the, the battle starts in the morning, um, uh, th that would be the time to attack. Uh, and that, uh, that this would be the moment that when, the Persian king could basically take over and uh, and win the battle because the Greeks were in disarray. Now, the letter turned out to be a hoax, but Xerxes fell for it, and he immediately ordered the Persian fleet into the mouth of the Bay of Salamis. His idea was to surprise the Greek fleet before it was supposed to set sail the next morning. Whether Herodotus is accurate in how he presents the influence of Themistocles over the likes of Eurybiades, or whether Herodotus is even accurate in what he says about the contents of the letter is unknown. Herodotus, remember, traveled around the Greek world reciting accounts of other places and customs and different peoples, and that's how he made his living out of being a traveling storyteller. So uh, we don't, uh, the degree to, so Herodotus' account of Themistocles' engineering of the Battle of Salamis and his role in that battle he could have, Herodotus could have easily been relying on a pro Themistoclean family tradition because, uh, you know, biting the hand that feeds you is not a good thing. So if these were the people who were kind of patronizing him to write this, uh, then he would have put in a better word about it. Whatever the case of that may be, um, we don't really know. But uh, it is, it, whatever the case of that may be, we do know that Xerxes's fleet meant the uh, did, did um, Xerxes took the bait and and he uh, and he brought them into the Bay of Salamis where he found the entire Greek fleet waiting for him not in disarray not about to, to leave but rather waiting for him and in, in perfect battle order Themistocles was ready for the Persians he had anticipated all of this and behind the Bay at Salamis there was a narrow channel 
Themistocles hid the bulk of his fleet in that channel. When the Persians sailed into the Bay of Salamis, they saw only a few Greek ships there, and they thought the fleet was already scattering. Some of them must have escaped during the night. At that point, with the Persians in the bay, it's a fairly narrow bay, Themistocles gave the order to attack. His ships came out of the channel, and they rammed the Persian vessel's broadside. Imagine those bronze hooks on the prow of a trireme smashing into the wood of a Persian vessel broadside. As at Artemisium, these heavier Persian ships were unable to maneuver as quickly and effectively in the straits at Salamis as the Greek vessels could maneuver. The Persian vessels were so big, and there were so many of them, that they really were sitting ducks this time. And as the Persian ships scrambled to maneuver, they tried to turn around to face the Mysticles' fleet. A number of Persian ships actually ran afoul of each other. And that just added to the chaos and confusion. Xerxes now realized that he had been duped by Themistocles' letter. It finally hit home, but it was too late. As the Persian ships were holed, they quickly sank. And to make matters worse, the Persians hadn't learned to swim since the Battle of Artemisium. So again, a great many of them drowned. And all in all, some 200 Persian ships were destroyed at the Battle of Salamis. And um. Regardless of any propaganda on Herodotus's part, Salamis was very much the victory of Themistocles and the Athenian army. In fact, Salamis was a turning point in the Persian Wars. Xerxes realized it, as his actions after the battle indicate. He saw the whole thing because he was sitting on his golden throne on a promontory on the opposite coast watching how the battle unfolded. He wouldn't have been very happy, obviously, but what he did next confounded everyone. He simply left. He went home. Actually, he made for his palace at Sardis in the western part of the Persian Empire in modern-day Turkey. But he first ordered uh, the execution of the Phoenician captains, that is, the Phoenician fleet, uh, which was one of the allies of the Persians, accusing them of cowardice, that they had cost him the battle. But this, of course, was just a face-saving gesture. Then, along with the remnants of his fleet, and it really was just in tatters by then, Xerxes returned to Persia, he left behind his general Mardonius in, uh, uh, in charge of the Persian uh, land force. Well, if the outcome of the Battle of Salamis wasn't bad enough for the Persians, what, what must the land army have thought as news leaked to, their, to, to, to it that their king had fled and basically ditched his men? talk about a demoralizing effect on the troops. And this, of course, would neatly play into the Greeks' hands, right? The captain is supposed to go down with the ship, and so it's, it has a, there must have been a tremendously uh, uh, you know, demoralizing effect on the army. What are we ma to make of Xerxes' actions? Um, you know, isn't it the case that the general is supposed to stick around with his men and not flee to leave his troops behind? Mardonius was a skilled general, but he was not the great king. And on top of that, winter was now fast approaching, and the worsening weather conditions would be a cause of further problems for the Persians that were left in Greece. Rather than stake everything on a pitched battle there, and then Mardonius thought it prudent, and he was, I think, right to do so, to retreat north for the winter, to give himself time to regroup and think about what to do next. He successfully led his Persian troops out of central Greece and north to Thessaly, which, you remember, had Medized, and he was helped immensely in this by the Greeks not following up their victory at Salamis by attacking him at the same time. Uh, we'll talk about why they didn't do this in a moment. Mardonius would return to do battle in the following spring, but in the meantime, the Greek fleet, or more likely a portion of it, set off in pursuit of Xerxes and the remains of the Persian fleet, and we'll find out what happened when they caught up to it in a little while. With the Persians in such disarray, though, after Salamis, we might expect the Greeks to take advantage of this and march immediately to finish them off. For some reason, they did not do this. And so they let slip what must have been a golden opportunity, because Mardonius was able to escape north for the winter, he was able to regroup there, and he was able to bring the Greeks to battle again the following year. Why didn't the Greeks follow up their victory? The answer is simple, we don't know. <laughs> Since military campaigns were not usually waged in winter, this may have been a deciding factor. But then again, the Spartans alone of the Greek states trained and fought in the winter. Right? That's another thing that made them different from other Greek armies, who only trained and fought during the campaigning season, which was spring to the onset of winter. 
the Spartans were hardy folks. Um, so taking Mardonius on at this time, as winter was approaching, would not have phased the Spartan army. Perhaps the real reason lies more with possible quarrels amongst the, the allies, especially in view of the role that Themistocles had played in forcing the Greeks to do battle at Salamis. What he'd done was a gamble, what if the Greeks had lost? Themistocles had also gone against the decision of Eurybiades, remember, the commander of the Hellenic League. who He was the elected commander-in-chief. Remember, this was back at the Greek Congress in 481. The Athenians had climbed down and the Spartans had been elected as supreme commanders of land and naval forces. Eurybiades had said, we'll scatter, we'll leave, we'll all go back to our own homes to defend them. And Themistocles had, in effect, ignored that order. What he did was almost tantamount to mutiny, therefore. Themistocles' action then would not have sat well with Eurybiades, and it certainly would not have sat well with the Spartans, even less so now, given the outcome of Salamis and who was responsible for that battle. Thermopylae was a stirring example of Spartan honor and resolve. There's no question about that. But the Athenians had now defeated the Persians twice, once on land at Marathon in 490, and now at sea at Salamis in 480. This wasn't a minor skirmish at sea either. It had forced the great king out of Greece. It was the turning point in the war, which Thermopylae was not. The Spartans would have had their noses put well out of joint again, and they may well have resisted taking on Mardonius at this time as a means of exerting their authority over the Athenians. If this is true, if the Spartans allowed Mardonius to get away because they felt they needed to reassert their authority in some way over the Athenians, then it is another example of Spartan selfishness, selfishness for want of a better word. And it's an excellent example of how tensions continue to run high between Athens and Sparta. A point that, uh, you know, would make it no surprise that these two states would come to soon be at war with each other in just a few decades' time. Whatever the real reason for letting Mardonius escape north, whatever the real reasons, plural, uh, there was still a Persian army on Greek soil, and therefore there was still a major threat to Greek security. There was also the chance that Xerxes might return, bringing with him even more troops. After all, he had fled to Sardis, and from there it was an easy run back to the Hellespont, for a re return trip to Greece. So that winter of 480 to 479 couldn't have been an easy one for the Greeks. In the spring of 479 BC, that is the opening of the campaigning season, Mardonius sent his ally, Alexander, king of Macedonia, to Athens. Of course, just to state the obvious, this is not Alexander the Great, who would come uh, two centuries later. Or, I'm sorry, one and a half centuries later. This is an early example, uh, earlier Alexander. This Alexander told the Athenians that Mardonius promised to let bygones be bygones, and he requested that Athens ally with Persia. This was to be a separate peace between Athens and Persia. It was not going to be part of a common Greek peace. And that's very interesting to me, that Mardonius signaled the Athenians out in this way. Presumably it was because of their navy, something, remember, the Spartans did not have. Mardonius's offer... Uh, in any event, was a significant climb down on the part of Persia, given the aims of Xerxes. Remember, he wanted to come and conquer all of Greece, according to Herodotus. And again, according to Herodotus, there was an embassy from Sparta present in Athens at this time. And these ambassadors would have spoken at the Ecclesia, the assembly, which debated Mardonius's offer, presumably urging the Athenians not to accept it. In practical terms, Athens would be seen as Medizing, and it's no surprise that the Ecclesia did, did decide to reject Mardonius's offer. As a result, Mardonius now had no choice but to march against the Greeks. Given the non-existence, to all intents and purposes, of the Persian fleet, the fate of Greece would be decided at one final battle, and it would be a land battle. Mardonius marched into Attica through Thebes, which had Medized earlier and he picked up a Theban contingent of troops along the way to fight with him. The Athenians had evacuated Attica again, so when Mardonius approached it, he found it largely deserted again, one more time. And therefore, in the spring, or perhaps early summer of 479, Mardonius secured Attica again. His action was in response to the Athenian rejection of his peace overtures. At this point, when Mardonius had taken Attica again, the Athenians urgently sent for help to Sparta. They even said, Herodotus tells us, 
that if the Spartans refused to help them this time, they would withdraw from the war. Evidently, the, the Athenians remembered their plight before Marathon when Sparta refused to commit troops, and this time the Athenians were using the threat of Medizing if Sparta didn't comply, and apparently it did the trick. A Spartan army of 5,000 hoplites, each soldier supplemented by seven helots, as I mentioned earlier, marched out to help Athens. This ratio, incidentally, of seven helots to each Spartan hoplite gives us some idea of the ratio of helots generally to Spartans. Presumably the Spartans did not bring every helot with them, so perhaps we have ten helots for every Spartan citizen? Eleven? Twelve? Who knows? Be that as it may, when Mardonius heard of the Spartan army marching into Boeotia, he moved back into Boeotia as well. At Plataea, on the border between Attica and Boeotia, the armies of the Greeks and the Persians faced off. Herodotus tells us that the Persian army numbered 330,000 men, but that figure is impossibly high. He also tells us that only 3,000 of it survived, and that the losses on the Allied side were only 159. So again, we have to take these figures with a big grain of salt. The Greek army was commanded by Pausanias, nephew of Leonidas, and actually the regent of Leonidas's young son. He arranged the Greek line high above the plain of Plataea, and its position was essentially a defensive one. The two sides, for a few days, engaged in some minor skirmishes and sallies, presumably just sort of checking each other out, but nothing in particular. Finally, Mardonius knew that the stalling tactics had to stop, and so he gave the order, and he attacked the Greek hoplite line face-on. The battle was hard fought, it was a typical hoplite battle, tough fighting, casualties, nasty. But victory went to the Greeks. The Spartans played a conspicuous role in it because of their bravery and because of their planning. In the fighting at Plataea, Mardonius himself was killed, yet another blow to Persia. And the, the Theban sacred band, an elite infantry corps that we'll learn more about when we learn about Alexander, was also decimated. Although the Persians fled from the battlefield, there was to be no going, uh, there was not going to be the opportunity to regroup this time as after Salamis. Mardonius's sword, incidentally, was displayed on the Acropolis in Athens. And that's a nice touch, isn't it? Because the, the symbolism is obvious, right? Someone who came to loot and burn Athens eventually uh, was brought down and his own sword was kind of put up as spoils. The victory at Plataea was a complement to that at Salamis, and Plataea was the end of the Persian wars on Greek soil. But it wasn't the end of the conflict. News reached Greece around the time of the battle, on the same day, according to Herodotus, that the Greek fleet had pursued the Persians after Salamis and had caught up with the Persians at Mycalae, off the coast of Ionia. So this is in the uh, Aegean Sea, just to the south uh, west uh, off of Turkey modern-day Turkey. Uh, the Greeks had caught up with the Persians there and defeated them in battle. The outcome of this battle was hardly a surprise to Herodotus, who says that the Greeks couldn't lose the Persian war because of a divine intervention on their side. He believes Xerxes was fated to lose because of his hubris, his arrogance, which we'll learn more about in our next lecture. He had angered the gods. He had crossed the line as a mortal man, and the gods were going to reward his hubris, his arrogance, with defeat. This is a nice instance, really, of Herodotus's belief in supernatural causation. And that is a topic, as I said, I would like to return to in our next lecture. Xerxes's arrogance, that is. Uh, and speaking of that, in conclusion, speaking of our next lecture, we're going to conclude our analysis of the Persian Wars then. And along the way, we're going to ask some questions about them and about their repercussions. Uh, for relations between Athens and Sparta in particular, will then be at the end of the Archaic period. And as I said before, the Persian Wars are the door to the Classical period, and they also form the backdrop to the rise of Athenian imperialism in the 5th century BC. But before we dive into the Classical period, I want to talk more about how and why I see the Persian Wars as this transition period between Archaic and Classical Greece. And I want to do this because I think these wars give us a glimpse into how the Greeks, and not just us, saw them as well. Thank you.